I had a first cousin, one Arthur McBride. He and I took a stroll down by the seaside. Was seeking good fortune and what might betide. It was just as the day was dawning. And after we rested, we went for a tramp. We met Sergeant Harper and Corporal Cramp. Besides, we drummer who beat up for camp with his rowdy dow dow in the morning. He said, Me young fellows, if you'd bought a list, it's a guinea I quickly shall press in your fist. Besides which a crown for to kick up the dust And drink the king's health in the morning Had a wee been such fools as to take the advance With a wee bit of money we'd have to run chance Were you thinking no scruple to send us to France Where we would be killed in the morning He said me young fellows if I hear one more word Why instantly now will out with me sword And into your bodies a strength might afford From now me gay devils take warning But Arthur and I we took in the hut And we gave them no chance for to lunge out their sword Our wedding shillelies came over their heads And paid them right smart in the morning For the wee drummer, we rifled his pouch And we made a football of his rowdy dow dow And into the ocean to rock and to roll And bade it a tedious returning As for the old rapiers that hung by their sides We flung them as far as we could in the tide To the devil I pitch you, says Arthur McBride To temper your steel in the morning Welcome to the Crash Chords Podcast. Of course, we started off with a song by our guest. Um, Panelist Parker is here this week, and he did Arthur McBride, which is one of the songs he leads when performing with the Wasties, and I wanted a, an acoustic stripped-down solo version for this podcast, so thank you, sir. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, before we get into Painless and what he's brought us and a little bit about him, I just want to remind people that this past Tuesday, another Autographs episode has come out. This is I Go Back Into Nerdcore. I'm interviewing... Back? <laughs> yeah, you never left. You never really The week left. before was Shy Boy, so I did. Yeah, but that was like a vacation. You didn't really exactly. leave. Um, this time I uh, you interviewed... You out for a sec. <laughs> I interviewed Adam Warrock, who is um, someone I've mentioned on the show a lot. He was a lot of fun to talk to. He um, was part of the trifecta of Magic the Gathering players who had talked about each other on several episodes with Tribe One and Michael Kill. His newest EP also features production work by Michael Kill. So there was a lot of crossover in that episode. Please go check it out. Also, I want to thank Tony again for being on the podcast last week. It's a shame he's going all the way to Milwaukee. We can't have him on as often. But Tony! Don't leave us, Tony. But he brought us a great album and, and helped provide for a great show. So thank you for that. Um, I want to start the show also by plugging your latest release, um, Painless, which is Live in Brooklyn, which is a live recording you did in Brooklyn. Yes, imagine uh, that. Where did you uh, record so the album? Be titled. I recorded the album in my living room. Oh. We were doing, um, we were doing this big old photo shoot. I also, um, as po- part of my polybanderous existence, I play <laughs> with uh, quite a few of my fellow Wasties in Eli August and the Abandoned Buildings. And we were shooting a video for a song called Slow Start off um, an EP we put out recently called A Heartache Suite. And Slow Start's kind of our big bouncy single off that one. And the day after we shot the video, uh, Molly and Rob were still in Brooklyn. And they've been hanging out with me and harmonizing and playing along on a bunch of my songs. And I had wanted an example of my live stuff to submit to a festival, music festival, that they want to hear uh, something that shows off what you can do live. So we'd been talking about doing something, and we had done um, sort of a... Actually, I don't even remember if it was that same day. At some point, at some time, when we did something with Eli August, um, 
the day after, we had a little house concert in my house. We invited a bunch of people over, and we did a bunch of material live. It was marginally rehearsed, so it had a nice loose feel to it. We didn't quite stick all the landings, as it were. Um, but it's really great working with those two. They're very good at finding uh, harmonies. Um, so having them sing along really fleshes out the songs nicely and gives it dimension. And so, yeah, so we did this thing. Um, unfortunately, I didn't uh, make the cut for the festival this uh -huh. year, although I will be there in other capacities helping out Molly's mother and stuff. Okay. Oh, cool. um, well, let me pick you back up with a compliment, because I feel that you're one of those few musicians who I've heard that are that are pretty much fitting to every capacity. Like, you have this natural resonance in your voice where you're very excellent as a soloist. It just kind of carries it on its own volition, and it you could listen to it for two, three hours. Wouldn't really bother me in a typical folk <laughs> setting. At the same time, you're also a great backup singer. I think your the sort of backseat uh, position that you take as a member of the Wasties is very fitting. It fills them out. And speaking of your harmonies, for instance, I think it's it's uh, it's a very well rounded career you got. Well, I'm the only baritone they got. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> Rob's up there. Molly's <laughs> up there. They're all you know. Um, um, what I like the yeah. nature of uh, sparing. So, it. <laughs> So anyway, that that live album it didn't get get me the the spot I wanted, but it is available on Bandcamp, and for a mere seven dollars, it can be yours, or you can just like click on the tracks and listen to them for free if you're a cheapskate like me. <laughs> what I like about that record also is it shows off your live persona, which whenever I've talked about your performances, like at Steampunk World's Fair, your your engaging with the audience adds so much to your show, and you have a little bit of that on this record between the tracks. You tell some stories. You even have a, lo a longer intro track for Jake Leg, which I really love. I got the mm -hmm. Jake Leg too. Um, and you're also sandwiched between the two Wasties who are featured on that record, Rob, who's coming on next month, and Molly, who was our last wa Wastie on the show. There you go. Um, any other... I mean, my, by the way, um, the chemical I could not remember... At the time, it's triorthocresyl phosphate. Oh, on the Jake Lake 2 intro. Yes, I was like, I cannot remember for the life of me what it's called. I since memorized it, so that next time I do a big, long-winded intro song about this um, uh, Prohibition-era neurological malady, <laughs> I can actually get the pharmaceuticals right. Um, also, I want to take a moment before we dive into the album you've brought us. Um, is there any other new news in the world of Painless Parker you'd like to share? All sorts of great stuff. Since last time I've been on the show, I got myself engaged. Congratulations. Um, That's there's awesome. This completely crazy woman named Adrienne O'Hanlon. <laughs> and uh, I asked her to marry me. And the nutcase said yes. <laughs> so, so, that's, so you better yeah, that wrap was, that up as that quick was, as possible. That was back in May. That's well, cool. yeah, I'm not going to wrap it up anytime soon. Oh. But uh, And if you want to listen to pre-engaged Gnome, then please go back to episode 63, where we reviewed Leaving Eden by Carolina Chocolate Drops. Hear how sad and dejected I sound compared to now, or I'm content and happy <laughs> and everything is wonderful. Sunshine Stay tuned for a discussion about depression later in the episode. <laughs> well, yes, and this factors into it. Yes. Um, but yeah, so that was a big, nice thing. That's uh, awesome. Got a new full-time gig. That's great. Which is great, but although... Got to pay those else, bills. Yeah, but then all the bills keep going up, so they kind of cancels out. But, right. you know, it's good to work. Um, been doing a lot of music. Been playing cool. a lot with the abandoned buildings, which is fun, because we get to go on stage with anywhere from 5 to 11 players at times. There's a tuba involved. There are various horns. There's straight upright bass. Um, at, at one point, we had dueling mandolinists, but... Uh, the uh, senior mandolinist moved to Wisconsin. Oh, bummer. Well, that makes you but the senior mandolinist now. I know. I get first chair. That's the way. <laughs> that's the way the Senate works, actually. Yeah, so pretty much. Yeah. So yeah, I ascended to senior mandolinist, mm -hmm. first chair mandolin in the abandoned buildings. Which, let me tell you, folks, is very exciting. <laughs> it's fun. To, it's what what what's great. It's one of those gigs where I pretty much never have to be in front of a microphone so I can just bounce around on stage <laughs> which I love doing it's great doing my own stuff but it's really fun sometimes also just to be to be a sideman um, to be a musician in somebody else's band and just have that freedom to sort of rock out and, and just compliment what people are doing and focus more on your playing cheers awesome so cheers to that. that and I like so that's been fun um, and as you'll hear later on there's been some new uh, Painless Parker songwriting in the process um, hoping to have a 
decent parcel of stuff ready for World's Fair this spring. That's cool. right, so stay tuned uh, after the review. We'll have a song for you, and of course, at the end. Now let's get to uh, the album of the week, unless there's any more uh, nope. news, nothing you got? That's All right. it. Let's dive into this. Uh, this was your pick, of course, as the guest. Uh, sorry we had to pigeonhole you into recent works. We do have this <laughs> thing now where we're trying to actually lay down the law uh, with uh, our guests. Uh, you, you guys. Yeah, he wanted guys. to do an album from 2007, and uh, that's, just, that's just ancient. Just, I'm old-timey. Yeah, I can't well, help it, what man. What do you say? Uh, so anyway, you ended up choosing this, and this is a brand new album, or at least a new wish. It's as of 2014, 2014 correct? correct. Mm-hmm. And what did you bring us? I brought us still, I'm sorry, it's called Haven't Got the Blues Yet, and it's by Loudon Wainwright III. And if Wainwright sounds familiar, it's because he is Rufus's dad, as well as um, Martha's. That's right. And I was familiar, I was not familiar with Martha Wainwright, but I was familiar with Rufus mm-hmm. Wainwright. Um, and I knew his stuff as being... I mean, a lot of that sort of piano, outgoing, very, uh, very uppity, very moving, very rousing at the same time. Very, uh, chamber pop, I think, is yeah, what Chamber pop is around. a good way to put it, yeah. Um, definitely would not have expected that he would have come from this background. A lot of times mm-hmm. I like to, you know, look for, look for little mm-hmm. traits here and there that carry around, carry yeah. down, perhaps, uh, certainly influences. I actually yeah. found more in common with Loudon Wainwright III and your work than I did <laughs> Rufus Wainwright. So I think I'm just going to leave that Which this aside. was a funny thing, because I didn't really know anything about him until this summer. Hmm. I had the opportunity to uh, be at uh, Philadelphia Folk Festival, or uh, as, as those in the know call it, Philly Folk. And he was the headliner. He played the last night, and there were some amazing acts actually there. Uh, Jason Isbell played. Um, Natalie McMaster was there. Tempest were there. They had, um, oh God, what were they? Um, Old Crow Medicine Show. Um, and this, and he was actually really one of my favorite acts. I knew that he was a big deal, that he was a folky from way back. I said, okay, we'll check this out. I didn't, never heard his music, dimly aware of who he was. And he just blew my socks right off. And you said when you saw him live, he only played with a guitar. He played, yeah, he, it, was, it was classic, you know, old school Dylan style, just up there, just him, guitar, no band, no nothing. And he just had people eating out of the palm of his hand. Incredible charisma, incredible control of his dynamics, of his tone, very expressive, emotive, great storytelling. He really knows how to spin a yarn. It's um, very clear just, that from yeah. uh, for a guy in his in his sixties, that's definitely the the environment that he's comfortable with. And I mean, you think, mm-hmm. all right, he's sixty years, he's been doing this for a very very long time, probably playing in a lot of coffee shops. Yeah, he's that an kind of old pro. Yeah, yeah. This guy, yeah, he's uh, a contemporary of a lot of the musicians we mentioned. Mm-hmm. A contemporary of uh, of Dylan. Dylan, of course. Well, yes, that's <laughs> which we just mentioned. To some extent, he's he's essentially a contemporary of the nineteen sixties folk rock. And yet, he didn't, that's he doesn't where seems, he got his start. Yeah, it doesn't and seem he, like he went very like like head on political, or did he? I don't know. I, I mean, again, I haven't went and gone and investigated his catalog just because I'm listening to so much other he's stuff. He's got a big catalog. You're he's, got, he, he's got a lot of stuff, and I've just been um, pursuing other avenues. I've been looking up a lot of uh, Jewish music and klezmer lately. Well, um, stay tuned because we <laughs> might very well get an appearance on this album. All right. Um, I'd say this yeah. is a good time to start into the beginning. Let's do it. Let's so do the first this. track is Brand New Dance, which is the first track on the record. Um, and we start right off with kind of a, rock, a very general rock and roll, rockabilly kind of high energy intro track. Mm-hmm. It's um, rock and roll, but of course rock and roll is born right out of like old, old school blues. Just yeah. a little bit peppier, more designed for like high yeah. school dance floor, that kind of thing. This it movie. fits that yeah. bar. This really, has, this really has that classic 50s sort of Sun Records sound. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Sam Phillips stuff with the reverb and the sort of uh, Chuck Berry ish guitars. Johnny Be Good kind of a sound, yeah. Jerry Lee yeah. Lewis kind of piano. Jerry Lee Lewis, early Elvis, all the, the early cash, all the good stuff. But still um, including the earlier horns mm-hmm. and piano that you'd, you'd sort of come now to you hear, hey, you'll hear uh, it. Sweet Little Sixteen by uh, Chuck Berry. The, the solo is a clarinet. Yeah. <laughs> and it's literally this guy who looks like an old klezmer dude in like a white shirt and a tie and thick glasses playing it. It's the craziest thing. So it's definitely so. This is that kind of like fifties boogie. It and definitely. But he's singing a rockin' song about getting old. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, 
That's the interesting thing, considering the track is, of course, called Brand New Dance, and what's brand new to, you know, a guy who's getting up there in, in his years, eh, it tends to be a little bit debatable, and of course you have to kind of weigh it against your time period. It's it's yeah. so clear that it's dipping back into the into the deep, deep past that I think you need to take that as a little bit of a joke, but there's a problem, I think, um, at least toward a modern audience, just picking this up and being like, hey, remember that era? The funny it's, thing it's, is that this, with this era is when you'd have songs about brand new dances. Yeah, yeah. and that's why it's friendly. And his well. brand new dances having to bend over and try to get his shoes on <laughs> at his age with all his joints aching. And he's got a new smell. It's called The Old Man. <laughs> it's interesting because it's fairly slick production on this one. So it sets it up as like, you know, very professional backing band, all this stuff. And you think it's going to be a little bit middle of the road. It doesn't set the bar all that high. It doesn't set the bar, and actually in, in some ways that almost relates back to the discussion about, you know, why we review new albums and such. But it's, yeah. it's never to, like, impugn previous errors. It's more to say that, you know what, leave that stuff, leave that stuff alone sometimes. Like, you mm -hmm. can always go back and listen to, you know, things from that era. It's not as if it can't be furthered, but sometimes you gotta know when to just, like, leave it. I'm not, I don't think this is a case of that, necessarily. It's just... It's just it's bound to, to make people question why, unless you focus purely on the satire, which is kind of self-evident. Mm. There's a new dance craze sweeping the land. First you get out of bed, then you attempt to stand. It's very... It, you kind of have to sympathize a little bit, but it's mm -hmm. comical because it's yeah. all you can do about the subject of getting old. And it's meant to be goofy, and what I also really like about it is just the, the framework of the whole thing, even though... It, it's a familiar sound. It's so high energy, you can't help but just get into it once it starts. It really pulls you in because it's an engaging track, even though it's about getting old, whether you can relate to that specifically or not. Well, the entire sound does come off as very classic rock, or not even classic rock, rock and roll yeah. pop, uh, which means that it's instantly going to be catchy, it's instantly going to get stuck in your head, and it's instantly going to raise your energy levels. It's... It's a little ironically bit... enough subject matter considered. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 formulaic in that way, but it's still because it's something that I frankly don't hear too much of nowadays unless I'm specifically diving into the past. Mm -hmm. It still remains almost refresh. Well, almost like a a a kind of like a revival kind of a feeling to it. Yeah. The I thing am is like when when I first when I first heard it, I, I decided I'd listen to it cuz um when I saw him live he kept mentioning I'm, I have an album that's going to be escaping soon, I believe was the way he worded it. I was like eventually I was like, "Okay, I bet that album's out now." And listen to it. And I heard the first track I was like, "Oh great, he's going to have like a full band, he's going to try to rock it. I don't know how I feel about this." Um but then But of course he go he takes different directions. And I am going yes. to withdraw one thing I said earlier about uh well about the relatability factor, because if you do, as I said, focus on that satire alone. Uh, Matt, you mentioned something about whether you can relate to it or not. Yeah. Uh, obviously, suggesting that the subject of getting old is is something that's purely left to people in their fifties, sixties, seventies. It's Which is not, not true. Especially yeah. when you consider now, it's kind of almost vogue to like be in your twenties and thirties and notice all the little things that slowly start to remove you from your teenage peak. Like, identifying those things, like, up oh, first the knees start to go. And it's like, all right, even if you can't, like, completely put yourself in it, you can at least empathize. Yeah. And you're going to get there. You're going to be dealing with the same exact thing. I so I, 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 I acknowledge it. I almost wonder if because we're in a period of such rapid change in terms of technology and pop culture and the attention span for everything is so short, if we feel getting older more keenly now. Mm. Because it it's so apparent. Yeah. Because things change. I, so I go around going like, oh, I'm old and stuff. I'm 34. That's not that old. Nope. When you're old, you're not. Not, things. not yeah. Uh, See, you're not old I by feel, age. I feel creakety sometimes. I get up in the morning like, man, I used to be able to... Drink I'm, more and I'm not noticing feel tired the next day. I'm noticing I don't understand <laughs> memes that are now hitting the internets. I'm and noticing I don't, I don't know want where, to. <laughs> no, I don't know oh where God, they're from. Kids. <laughs> it bothers me. I don't know the origin on these memes, which I, it used to be something you just knew. Well, yeah, you'll get over it. I think. It, you know, all <laughs> that, of this, that's, all that's, this is proves we're playing right into his shoes. Yeah. I feel like the one, the best thing about turning thirty is you are completely absolved of any responsibility of trying to be cool. Yep. Forget it. That's yep. over. Yep. I, I gave up it's that true. like five or six years ago. So yeah. it hasn't bothered me for It's years. more like you start setting your own trends. Exactly. Which means like forget about it by the time you're I mean, you're I've, your... I've been, it hasn't bothered me for like since high school. But it was like this point it's like official. Nobody can be like, man, why aren't you trying to be cool? 
Yeah. Exactly, which is why nobody we're, asks anymore. No, yeah, nobody further cares. that along. And, and put, even if you've been like, I don't care. It's like now there's like all the social pressure is off. And you can feel a bit more, breathe easy. Mm-hmm. I mean, where are those loafers? <laughs> where are those socks and sandals? There's even this moment mm-hmm. where he takes this little aside to, of course, talk about things that are that are very old manny. If you get about like twenties, thirties, and I, I think it's very common to, I guess, complain about politics at any age, but certainly if you've been around it for a very, very long time, then it's it's just like you start to notice the cyclical pattern of it. So he has this one stanza where it's just, hey, hallelujah, it's election time. Vote in the booth for the big boss line, but it's the same old song, the same old dance, same long shot at the same slim chance. Yeah, one of those fools is bound to win, but it's the same old, same old, all over again. So yeah. it's just that bitterness that yeah. kind of steps through amidst all the other stuff. Eh. He's been, coming up from multiple yeah. angles, so I'll give it. If you've I'll been a folky since the '60s, you're going to be a little bit bitter. True, just a touch, just a scotch. Yeah, but I'll also defend the song. I think for one one other reason, and that's the fact that it does, of course, at its core. If you're looking past the lyrics, I think it's the crowd pleaser for people that did, after all, want a old fashioned song from a guy that is. Tends to have an old-fashioned shtick, and it's yeah. out, and it's entertaining. I mean, at its core, it's entertaining. Yeah, it's, and yeah. that's important. It's a fun song, especially to start a record. You yeah. want to have a little fun. It gets people invested, and that's why the shift in the second track is so much harder. I think, we, but it's no, not a there's bad. There's no harshness to it. In track two, it's sudden. based. I wouldn't even say it's sudden. It does not feel out of place for the combination because spaced is. Heavy and brooding right away from from its inception. The percussion is deep. It got a tuba. I mean, you can't get much deeper oh, in, there's in so the much, horn section within a tuba. There's so much more here. I mean, this Sub-contra-based is contra bass sax. Okay, I, you you can get a little bit deeper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, subcontra basses are are about as deep as it goes. But those things are so big, and you have to lug them around. It's it's pretty much impossible to incorporate <laughs> into your band. But that's just a minor. Pretty much side. need a semi trailer exactly. For it. um, people have to. It's watching middle schoolers play it, and if if your high school is privileged, if your middle school is privileged enough to have it, you have to step on a little thing. All right, Grandpa so. One and Grandpa Two, let's rein it in. All right, I have so much to say about this track because this was this was a welcomed shift for me. Obviously, oh, yeah, I absolutely. made it clear that this no matter what lens you view the first track through, the fe- first track is definitely kind of a been there, done that. You yeah. need to focus on satire if you're going to, you know, get as much out of it. But this offers you new thing, but not. I'm not going to say new. Of course, it reaches toward more of a, like a klezmer environment, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. It's this old school, uh, like turn of the century kind of thing. So he's gone from the 1950s to the turn of the century, which is a very odd shift, especially considering the remainder of this album tends to go back toward a more a more ubiquitous style of folk that has kind of ever present throughout the 20th century. But this is very focused. This yeah. has got that that Yiddish you know twist just seeping through in Ooh, all of these so, somewhere between y- yiddish on the one hand but also the sort of like what weimar era cabaret yeah type thing a little bit of that theater and, and I th- we both kind of noticed that it was it was drinking from the same well as uh tom waits at certain points tom waits likes to go back into these into these uh these pools yeah it seems to be where he he took up some of his influence but of course he fused it with the kind of like yeah. uh out there piano rock that was around at the time. He made his own shtick, and I think he also ended up incorporating this back in his island era, which emerged in, like, the 80s. But Mm the point is, it's there, and he likes to use really bizarre instrumentation, or at least reaching from the past. And in this case, I mean, I thought it was spectacular just for the four instruments present, which Mm -hmm. is predominantly accordion, guitar, of course, for just your rhythm section, and then clarinet, which is really dominant throughout the track, that really mm. breathy sound, very warm, and then the tuba just to kind of like drive it along and provide that oomph, that, that subtle punch that's just, it, it's excellent. So the Not texture... Just the, the punch, but there's something about having a, a tuba, a brass instrument hold down the mm-hmm. bass that just gives it a certain color, it gives it a certain... Almost like a, a the Roomba type of, of a too, sway. Yeah, yeah it, it puts you in the mood of an orchestra as opposed to like a rock band or something. It, it really changes. Um, yeah, punch is too broad it, of it a word. It gives a very different foundation to everything that plays upon it. Uh, and, you know, he, he sort of gets a bit of that, um, some of the jazz, and he does a bit of scat singing on this, which is kind of funny. This is like where he gets from like a very safe, like the first track was pretty safe musically. Mm-hmm. This one he's really like not afraid to be weird. That's where I would actually say I don't feel the shift from track one to track two. While tonally, yeah, 
but just the speed at which he's spitting out these lines, mm-hmm. the scat, everything like that, keeps the upbeat of the original mm-hmm. rock and roll that he has, and keeps a very groovy through line throughout the two pieces. Yeah. It, this it, one definitely has some funk. And it's it's connected. That connection between the two does does so much to really take these two very divergent musical ideas to some extent and, and bring them brings them pretty well together. Well, I think me. what you're talking is more about his his playful his playfulness from a vocal standpoint. Yes, and that that's, comes that's through what, in that's what locks it through. That comes through in lyrics and subject matter, and I'll get to that in just one second, uh, as soon as I say just one more thing about the instrumentation here, because I, I really put a lot of emphasis on the clarinet in this piece more than I do almost any other instrument in any other piece on this album because of how focused it is and that, that breathiness and how when this track opens, there's this certain combination between the clarinet and the accordion that just, it works on a fundamental standpoint. And I think that's why when we were talking about the tuba before and you mentioned that it you know it provides something beyond that of a punch but the foundation for which the track can really, can really break out, I think it's about that juxtaposition between this airiness on one hand that the the clarinet has and the heights that it really reaches when it's like playing around from a um, a klezmer solo standpoint, an improvisatory standpoint, and then the, the the tuba, as you said, really really holds it down and just contrasts that with this 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 mm-hmm. this rumble. I, I just I absolutely loved everything about this. It could have been an instrumental, frankly. This track still would have worked for me. <laughs> Furthermore, you even get a replacement. The accordion is traded out, uh, takes more of a backseat role later in this track, and then. Uh, the trumpet steps forth, and then you get not just the duality of the accordion and the cl- clarinet, but then the clarinet and the trumpet, which are also pretty close in terms of range. But you get a more of a more of a crisper tone, I think, to the trumpet than you do the clarinet. But the clarinet still keeps that breathiness in place. All of this is just such a contrast from the first track that I still think it's not it's not out of place, Matt, for you to said it's 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 jarring or perhaps um, perhaps harsh. Uh, but it, it's it's going to serve to like put you in a different world such that you won't even remember that the first track took place, perhaps. Yeah, well, I mean, well, also part of it is the content, and this is where we get into where what the song is about, which, yeah. whereas the first track was a little goofy, it, it, it made light of this getting old feeling. This is way goofier, and also, as someone who owns a car in the city, speaks to me, because the entire theme of this track is the ridiculous things that you go through as a driver with alternate side parking. Content is similar in one way, and that's, of course, the fact that it, it focuses on, and he focuses, rather, on very simple subjects, and he takes yeah. them and then exploits them. Getting old, well, that's simple. Let's exploit it. Finding a parking space, that's as simple as it gets. But he takes it in pretty bizarre directions. A car in the city is just a pain in the ass. That's an albatross made out of steel and glass. It's nice to know that you can get out of town fast, but a car in a city is just a pain in the ass. First of all, love the imagery with the albatross. Most mm-hmm. kids under 25 are never going to get it. Most kids under 30 will probably not get it. Um, second off, completely true. But the phrasing, his pacing, his speed, is just his attitude about the whole thing. It says humor, but it's the sort of humor that everybody's got. It's it's, it's, it's observational. Well, let's yeah. take the primary line, the chorus, if you will, and just the inflection he uses here. A space is the place that's a beautiful thing. Okay, great. He used one line, but it's about the rhythm, the, the meter in which he approaches it. The space is the place that's a beautiful thing. He kind of trails off a little there. When I see one that's free, I want to sing, squeezing into a tight one, such pleasure it can bring. The innuendo here is hard to pass. It's hard to laugh at. Um, hard not to laugh at. And then finally, he closes it off with this ABA structure. A space is a place that's a beautiful thing. And he does this again in later verses. That's just the rhythm of that. Space is a place that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's got yeah. that dakata, dakata, sort of playing uh, against the time. That's held by the rhythm, uh, is, by the rhythm yeah. guitar itself. Which, and which then gives it, a, gives it a little more of that kind of Roomba thing going on. Then the two-step with the um, with the tuba. Yeah. And every other beat, it, it, it steps in. So you have other instances of this later on with... Um, Sometimes you find a space for which you must fight. Sometimes you find a space for which you drive around half the night when folks take up a space and half that's not right or something like that. It, it, it goes into all this, like, like complaining about the minutia. A lot he of even that. references specific alternate side parking rules that apply in Brooklyn. Yeah. Like, no, he's, the he's 1130 to 1 o'clock is this neighborhood where we're recording. So, like, 
that's what really got me is this uh-huh. is one of those songs that if you're not like I was, the first time I listened to the album I, I hadn't gotten much sleep and I was listening to it at work so halfway through the song I hadn't really been paying attention I was enjoying the klezmer sound but I wasn't really listening to the content and then I heard the line about alternate side and went wait what <laughs> and then I had to go backwards and listen to it again because it really gave me it, it, more of a sense of the content and it's relatable like I've already uh-huh. said on Facebook it's my new anthem for living in New York it's- I was bitching about parking last night when I was over a friend's place uh, frankly, I couldn't find a space for about 25 minutes, which is actually pretty quick for where I was in Brooklyn. Um, it's it, it, it's every man's songs. It's already becoming a major part of the theme work in this album. It's every man's kind of an idea. Granted, it's a little more specific to what type of man you're talking about, but these are all very relatable ideas. Well, in this case, more of the Road Rage brand, because he goes further to say, and this is a little bit much, when I see a space that I don't even need, there's a twinge and a feeling it's akin to greed. I mean, that's pretty harsh. It's a case of space envy, I say so indeed, when I see a space I don't even need. Again, that ABA structure. But (laughs) space envy, obviously, again, going back to the same kind of innuendo. You you find parking, and then you start walking the three and a half blocks, to your friend's place and then you realize there's a spot right outside his door because the pizza man was there a little bit too long and then all of a sudden you had a spot you get pissed this is addressed by any any mm. new york centric uh medium new york centric uh sitcom for instance seinfeld did it you know before with like yeah. george coveting the 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 ideal spot directly in front of the building in front of the door itself and you, you could go on and brag about it what a yeah. simple thing to brag about but again as john said simple simple man's uh Simple man's ideals. And in, in, uh, Stuff that all of us can relate to. Yes. Yeah. And I think also, again, just speaking back to what Steve was saying about the music, I think that it's, it's nice that it takes this kind of sound that we've heard before, but still does a little more with it. It's not just klezmer. It's got that little rumba mm-hmm. feel. It's got, like, all of these different things. Yeah, and, and actually, in fact, there was something else I, I noticed. And, and when, if, if, if you know anything about sort of the history of klezmer in America in the 20th century, there was a lot of cross-pollination between it and jazz and swing. They were, band. jazz was taken from it right and left, especially in the 20s, um, so that by the time it got to the 30s actually there was something more that i identified here and that was the kind of like macabre undertones that you'd find in like cab calloway's work and this stuff Mm. is in my head now because i recently did an article on on cab calloway and his work with uh with max fleischer and and the betty boo cartoons but i mean those if you listen to some of the songs like uh like minnie the moocher um Mm -hmm. saint james infirmary it has that that kind of you know this sort of like going back and forth between like Dorian and then Mixolydian, Dorian Mixolydian, and and using mm. these modalities that you find in, in in klezmer, you know, right and left, it's all of it is really interconnected. Cross pollination yeah. is, is 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 barely even the word. It was just yeah. it was just a flat out influence, and then from which different different would, branches took place. Yeah, a lot of the times it would be players who'd play in a jazz band and then go play in a klezmer band for different events. Mm-hmm. So the same guys were making the same music yeah, in a so lot of cases. I go to Tom Waits, the Cab Calloway, to straight up Klezmer. Yeah. So, Interesting that he, on that, he, uh, that he pulled from that, though, because then it's right back to In Oak. a Hurry. Yeah, In a Hurry is the third track, and it's this slow, sweet-sounding, very folk-centric song, um, reminiscent it, of Bob Dylan kind of style, with the bit. singing especially, and this kind of gravelly voice. Mm, it's not just gravelled. It's, uh, the voice is... It's worn. It's weary. Yeah. World weary in a way. It's, it's too many it's, cigarettes, it's too sanded. much scotch, yeah. that kind of a thing. And it's 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 you got know, that little bit of a. Well, now I'm going Italian, but that's because I have to. I am Italian, but it's got that little bit of a. And then you kind of an idea. You know. It's a little bit of a catch <laughs> yeah, in the throat. A little bit of a frog. Um, that combined with the soft folk. I guess that it's the pinnacle kind of idea of soft folk. It's, it's very much song. that kind of like introspective singer songwriter confessionally type of thing, sort of you know. This is more the, the appropriate sort of that, time that, to reference Bob yeah. Dylan, I think. I think so too. This, this one is very intimate in yes. terms of the instrumentation, and what's what's beautiful is that, um, just musically speaking, mostly it's him and his guitar. So this is like, mm-hmm. all right, we've had some fun. We're going to get down into something intimate. And it's only after intense. about two minutes that we add yeah. a mandolin, in fact. And we get we get some mandolin. We get some and it's, like it's accordion thin. It's swells. just like color. That's and, what, and that's the thing. Like um, the guys who are playing on this album, I've tried to look up some of the credits, but they're a little mangled. But um, 
the uh, the guys he's got playing on this are really top notch, both mm-hmm. in being able to do that wonderful stuff in the previous track and here, just like really knowing how to serve the song. There's just a little bit of mandolin, just a little bit of accordion, just like at the right points to accentuate it very gently. So both in terms of the players and and whoever was you know behind the board producing a lot of restraint and I really respect that. I love when people can do something very tasteful and just have the self-control not to just like throw an instrument all over the track because I'm really bad about that. Restraint so, is the word yeah. I would use. I, I referred to the mandolin as a, a form of like reserved comping because after all it is so it mm-hmm. is so thin he just kind of like enters in with these little swells here and there and then when he finally does have his mm-hmm. dedicated mandolin solo it's just so so trudging and so dedicated to each and every note as few as there may be Mm -hmm. um it's never really showy in at any moment it always takes a back seat and will refer to to the guitar at the end um there's really just emphasis on i think uh very simple motifs throughout that entire section and and letting the song shine because it's it's you know he's getting there's some humor in here but this one is more serious in its tone it's sort of this again he's singing and with bit of gravel in his voice which we can tell from the rest of the album is slightly affected but um i'll let him have this one i will, I will not begrudge him the affectation because it works very well for this character he's singing in the persona of a homeless guy who's at some kind of transit station not, well, not they're just homeless guy it's handler. more of a someone who knows what it's like to be there yeah not necessarily that he's there at this moment because it's it's a little bit wishy washy on the message, which is something I like. It's, it's not, not so, so clear cut about message. It's not a song with like a social agenda. It's more about it's about this empathy. It's about this guy. He's panhandling, and somebody who's obviously much better off materially than him goes by, and he's feeling sorry for the rich guy. Well, let's look at a few of these lyrics. Kind of amazing. I know you're in a hurry and probably late for work. That job must make you crazy. That ulcer's got to hurt. All those problems back at home, they're just killing you. The wife, the kids, the dog, the house. See what you go through. See you in the station, coming off the morning train. You're always in a hurry. You're always look the same. Your briefcase seems so heavy. Your neckties tied so tight. You always look so tired, like you've been up all night. It's, it's this, the funny thing I have to note, even just, 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 taking those lyrics at a glance, is that the music is in some sense trying to contrast the fact that the hurriness that he cites, the, the busyness mm-hmm. in this life, oh, the yeah. kind of trudging, mm-hmm. in the music it's is ironic. trying to take that down a notch. Yeah, it's, it's a song about, like, the lyrics are about this guy being in a hurry, but the song itself is moving very slowly. Well, I think it's because the guy who's observing him is not, is moving not in a hurry. He's yeah. just there yep. at the station trying to get enough money for a cup of coffee very or food. Very early in this record, what I really like the about him... The guy he's observing, I think, is in a hurry. I think you're in a hurry, so he's referring to the other guy that's in a hurry. Yeah, he himself that's my is point. not. The, okay, the yeah. singer who's singing the song, the, the voice, the narrator, is in no hurry at all, but he's observing somebody who is. Trying to be kind of the median there and just and take it down. The funny thing I need to no- note is just one more uh, moment, because it's not just the overall pace of the song, which we've already cited, is pretty slow. There's these specific moments right at the end of verses, like take, for instance, you always look so tired, like you've been up all night. This is what, in classical terms, would be called a rallentando. It's just a slight slowing of tempo at the ends of certain verses with an expected idea that you would return a tempo at the beginning of the very next verse, right on cue. But at the ends of verses, you take it down a notch just to kind of take a breather, like he's further trying to slow the pace, as if the overall song wasn't already apparent, wasn't already proving the point. I just, I thought it was a very nice touch. And he does that several times, even in in uh, kind of unique times where you take the lyrics, you know, we're both trying to make it in this shitty town. Like, you have to just address that and consider it. Let's just pause, take a breather, then get on with life. Everybody has to do that every once in a while. What I also really like at this point in the album already, after three tracks, is that as uh, he had a bit of goofiness in the first track, a lot of goofiness in the second track, and as funny as those tracks were, when he tries to take a serious tone with a little bit of humor, but it's mostly mm-hmm. very sincere and serious, I buy it. I believe it. I'm not... What I don't like about a lot of music that's funny 
is that it's just comedy music and it's punchline after punchline after punchline and that's not mm. what he's doing here. He's giving you funny observational humor but he's also showing mm. you that he does have heart. He can be sincere and that's what this song starts to show and we get more of that as the album goes on. And, and there's a lot of back and forth which I love the versatility of that. And conversely what I hate about a lot of singer songwriter and folksy stuff is some guys are trying so hard to be like soulful and earnest and confessional that really sounds forced. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm Remember one time with this this really amazing guitar player named Kelly Joel Phelps. I saw him play twice when I lived out in California. He played at this place called uh, Don Quixote's up in Felton in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And this one night, the guy who opened for him was just like trying so hard to be like deep and intense. And it was just <laughs> like, it just felt phony. Yeah, and, and especially and then this when guy you... would come on and just bam. When you look at these lyrics, I mean, it's they feel as if they were to... written in a diary, almost. Yeah. It's and, not... And like, you would never be pretentious to yourself, for instance. Exactly. And, and like, write, writing a song that is as serious, I think being a bit playful really helps the serious stand out better and be more palatable. Yeah, yeah because you're, the, you're yeah. giving it a layer and, and a heart. I know, that, that's something I try to do when I'm writing stuff. I always, like, usually I just avoid being serious and be funny because it's easier, because I'm like... I can try to be serious, but it's just going to sound dopey or it'll sound horrible to me. But if I do try to get more serious in my writing, I'll try to at least keep something in playful and try not to take myself too seriously. Which you will get in the mid-break track. Well, yes. It's what we'll I would get refer there, to yeah. as, as kind of a, a natural turn of phrase, which is why I enjoyed that line, you know, in this shitty town and the way yeah. he just slows that down. Um, th- there's there's really a lot in this, but it, it's one of those tracks that, of course, is very much like listen to the lyrics, listen to the lyrics, because the music itself is very slow. It's very it's very tasteful. We already addressed mm-hmm. that. It's, it's not really going to change up much. It plays out kind of like a lullaby. You, yeah. In fact, there are mm-hmm. so many verses in this. It you very well could fall asleep. Maybe that's the point. <laughs> that's it at the end. Hey, be nice. No, I'm saying that's actually that's to its credit. There we okay. cited before. There are there are there are excellent lullabies made in the world, and I think I think. When you consider his point in this track, I think to to be so successful as to make you take that level of breather that you're unconscious, that would be his point. Okay. All right. All From right. here we go to Depression Blues, which oh, is, yeah. surprise, surprise, a blues song. Um, it's got some really bluesy mandolins on it, which we get, makes me happy because people don't always think of mandolins as a blues instrument, but they can... We can pull it off when we really want to. This, this is the example that I would use as kind of a, a, a Delta Blues kind of track. It harkens back the closest, I think, in this album to like a Robert Johnson era. Um, mm-hmm. It's just got that blues and E. I think at some point I thought I detected bottleneck guitar. Yeah. And it, and it continues this sincere, heavier mm-hmm. feel. It's a more mm-hmm. uh, matter-of-fact but very, you know, um, just sincere lyrics about depression mm-hmm. and about being very upfront and open and, and but still engaging it. not even dealing it's more like how to escape depression because none of the things he describes come off as a true release from the depression itself mm-hmm. that's all coping mechanisms exactly yeah. that's what, exactly what i thought what, what's interesting is he starts it off you know the the line is like something 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 eshin how do you deal with your depression He'll, he'll cite, you know, some old blues singer and some religious thing. So it's like... It's Blind you, you Lemon got, Sings the Blues. Blind Lemon Sings the Blues. The does his Whalen session. Or the, the so first let me tell you what you plan to do about yeah, all your depression. Yeah, and he, he references um, Sleepy John Estes. He references in the first line, uh, what was it? Oh, gosh. I don't remember now. But. Well, he, remember, he, he references, obviously, you know, what, what John was mentioning, all these various things that people use. In, in yeah. many ways, it comes across as a very existential and track. because you're singing, singing about it and then these religions and what they do. And then he says, how are you going to deal with your depression? But at some point, he says, you're going to read an old fan letter. And I figure at this point, wait a minute, he's, he's talking to the mirror. Yeah, he's, he's, he's asking himself. himself, "What are you going to do about this?" That's right. And here, he's dealing right with following that. that line. In fact, yeah. "Blind Lemon sings the blues." The Jew does his wailing session. So let me tell you what you plan to do about all of that depression. Well, you suck it up, or write it out, or reread some old fan letter, or head to the nearest bar room, get drunk till it gets better. <laughs> I mean, that's that. Why I was starting to say this comes off as kind of an existential track because it really almost makes the claim that there is absolutely nothing you can do. That yeah. almost every single thing that we ascribed to helping you out of a situation is all it's all self-imagined I mean, I it, it go, never really helps in the end I would, perhaps even therapy 
I don't know. I mean, obviously it helps some people. It depends on who you are. Well, but he's making the claim that it it doesn't have to help you. There's nothing in the books that it will. Well, I think it's also part this idea he that... says it can help, but it's expensive. <laughs> the idea also that sometimes it doesn't Discovery. matter what you do as long as you find something that helps you. You know, yeah. this idea that it doesn't matter what the answer is. There is no right but, answer. But he never really finds something that helps him. Right. I well, mean, no, I think... That's I, the whole, that, but that's, that's the whole problem with that kind of an argument. He's not finding anything. That's why he's going through all these different ideas of how to attack this depression. That's why let me just play the middle route here. Because I think what, what Matt and, and Noam were claiming is that, well, you read, read some old fan letter or head to the nearest bar room and get drunk till it gets better. Gets better. It's, that's not really the cure. He's not, he's not advocating that as the answer, of course. That, as John is saying, are just examples. Yeah. They may not apply to you. Yeah. Notice it's, it's a matter of saying, or this, or that. He's just poking in the dark, which yeah. is why there really is no answer. That is the ultimate claim of this track, which I, I think is uh, I think is apt. It really is the case that you need to go find your thing, and whatever it's the it may strength be. of the track. I think too, is leaving yeah. it so open and kind of which what makes it so relatable and sincere is this the 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 the. the those moments and those words kind of add to that. Yeah, but I, that's not even talking about the musical aspect of it. As as the song goes along, there's the the, the light percussion comes in, the slow rumble in the background, mm -hmm. the bass starts becoming a heavier component, um, or and and very late uh, the high strings just adding flourishes on top of everything. The build up is so subtle as the song goes along. And nothing really takes center stage. Nothing takes away from the original uh, instrumentation of what was going on. But it the supports it so blues well. E. <laughs> it, it does a great job of just progressing. It fully progresses mm -hmm. along. And well, that, it, that's sort of just slow. so nice. It's got that nice slow burn. Which it's is not even fun. a burn. I, I, I don't see... A smolder. There you go. It's That's smolders. even more. Pro it's not strong enough to be a burn. It's just smoking. It's just building up and sort of filling up the room as it goes along. Until you get smoke inhalation and everybody dies because that's depressing. Well, it's depressing blues, oh, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah, depression blues. And it, it's interesting, like, think about, um, I think we, we talked at some point about, like, blues music. Like, if you listen to something called the blues nowadays, if you listen to, like, a modern B.B. King album or Buddy Guy or any of those guys. And it's so slick and produced and kind of upbeat sounding versus yeah. some of the early Delta stuff where you really hear, like, these people were poor, these people were downtrodden, these people had nothing. They There was nothing they could do to make their lives less crappy than just sing about how much it hurt. Nothing brought that out better, I think, than that whole, like, Robert Johnson trademark bottleneck guitar, just that twang, almost almost yeah. like a teardrop. It, it I, comes I, all across as very I, realistic. I, I, have, I, have back to it. I have a theory about blue notes um, <laughs> that, that has to do with, it's sort of a language thing. If you think about um, African-American music and its sources and, like, you know, people who were brought over to America as slaves and then denied every aspect of their culture, including, you know, polyphony and different rhythms, and different, you know, ideas about music. And then once they're free and doing blues and stuff, they're sort of stuck in these Western scales where the mm -hmm. blue notes don't exist because they're essentially quarter tones. Yeah. That idea of bending a string, bending a note to get there, trying to reach, you know, get a blue sounding note on a piano it's the idea of trying to say something try to articulate a certain feeling or agency or a pain that you just don't have the words for anymore because they've been taken away from you so you're straining against the tools that you have the language that you have to bend it and mash it and mutate it I bold fold bend spindle and mutilate it to make it say what you need to express. I would 100% ascribe to that that analysis, that interpretation of it. I mean, in many ways, it's the, it, it's. I think you could equate it to the uh, Western like affectation for dissonance. Whenever you find mm -hmm. something, it's it's a way of se doing a blue note without doing a blue note. Essentially, mm -hmm. is you mash down these like tonal clusters in such a way that you yeah. almost get that same exact vibe. And it's it's this attempt to find things you know outside of the norm. A, a lot of people claim that that's why uh, why 
you have more options, for instance, in the majors in the minor scale than you do just simply in the major scale. You play a happy song, well, you can't take it too many places. Mm-hmm. It has its limits. It has its natural limits in terms of just you know stepping into other modalities. But from from minor, it's so much more easier to step into like another mode. Mm-hmm. It's so much easier to step into Mixolydian and Dorian and such. Um, it just it, it's it's naturally built. It, it, it obviously born out of the idea that well, st- sad songs are more interesting. Sad stories in general are more interesting. Happy claim is really just kind of the period at the end of the sentence. Where can you go from there? You can shout it, proclaim it. That's about all you can do. You have no story if there's no conflict. (laughs) And meanwhile, he takes us into the last line here, which is that (laughs) after the show, when they all go home and you're left with all your problems, it's the depression blues you got there, boys. And that's one badass goblin. I love that line so much. It's beautiful. (laughs) It's a beautiful claim to, again, that that heavy hand that's just weighing you down. And from there we go into a very appropriate spot, a track called The Morgue. So we go back to the goofy, kind of lighthearted sound. This um, song is a little on the shorter side. It takes a country kind of structure completely. This isn't taking a, it is it, country. It, it this is, is country. full fledged from harmonica onward. It is a country song. And I'm glad that it came because I love three and four very much, but we I was ready to kind of get out of it a little bit, kind of you need a bit get, of a palate cleanser there. Yeah. Like that. And that's what this gave us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this gives us kind of the irony that was present in the first and second track. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, despite the segue, you know, we're okay, we're heading into the morgue thematically, he's he's following suit. But (laughs) from a musical perspective, he's he's immersed back in in irony. Mm -hmm. This this sort of Goofy, musical, and, you know, vocal, yeah. lyrical, and everything is. He's there. singing about a guilty. You died of a guilty conscience and a broken heart, and like this, like this <laughs> kind of silliness totally fits into the kind of country music he's referencing. We're talking about the early like Lefty Frizzell, Ernest Tubb, like Hank Senior type stuff um, from from way way back, and it's they a, tended to have a lot of novelty songs it's, like this that. This is so. uh, my wife left and took the dog. I miss that dog so much. The premise yeah, of all kinda. of country music and such. Um, but well, but that, again, uh, yeah, sort of. And again, that, that another way of dealing with you know, like the blues had this way of dealing with stuff. And country music also, a lot of it is sort of this dealing with you know your the travails of. Uh, you know, working class blue collar life, and it's you if know, you're not going to cry, you might as well laugh. Kind of an idea yeah, to it. Dealing with humor, it hits all the right marks for a country song. I think uh, did, didn't didn't Johnny Cash have something about like flush down the toilet of your love? Sound <laughs> it sounds like Johnny. Johnny. Yeah, it's something I, it was on like Live in San Quentin. Well, the thing I find interesting here is also the fact that it doesn't really obviously. Nobody, I mean, you could just accept this, that no one can actually die of a guilty conscience and a broken heart. But there is always that claim that exists that, well, if you've lost the will to live, then you might as well be dead. Yeah. So it kind of just addresses really that head on. Yeah. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> guilty conscience and a broken heart. Now you're dead, it's too late to be sorry. You, <laughs> you made it. Uh, it's just, it's very. It's a little bit of a gloat. It's like, yeah. You got your just desserts. Well, yeah. he's pretty much standing over the corpse in the morgue, gloating about his no, position. No, no, no. He's not just standing. It's, it's, he's come it's, to identify the body. Yes, yeah. he sees the, the, the blue-tinged body and gets a little bit of a shock. And then, well, they throw you back in the freezer, and it's, it's let's start saying got a frozen that. broken heart. <laughs> it's yeah. not just broken. It's frozen and, and cold like, and lifeless. A lot of his, and, he does some really great vocal stylings on the song. He really shows how versatile he is. He's not just a good folky. With a good voice, he can do a lot of different stylistic stuff, and he he, he gets really hammy and kind of goofs it up. Yep, but in in ways that work. That's like, why he actually, never goes overboard. And I just I have so much respect for him for mm-hmm. being able to do that. That takes a little, that takes a real pro. There's something <laughs> the um, the country reference that was made earlier. It's there's a reason why that's not too far off because after all, country music does tend to sort of channel all of this depression through a fairly positive medium. It's like, oh, well, okay, we are going to sort of sing the song in a major key and, and pretend that everything's not what it really is. You need to look to the lyrics for that. Mm-hmm. And that's where we bring in uh, what you just mentioned. His vocal stylings, again, take this this lighthearted view on a matter that's really not lighthearted. Of course, when you're talking about about death that was sparked by said depression that we just spent a whole track on and there was no irony there the previous track was 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 spot on and it brought you pretty far down now all of a sudden he addresses the morgue with those vocal stylings that are just 
they're goofy in their own way. Take the line, little did you know that when you got dumped, <laughs> yeah. and there's that sort of power, parabolic motion. That's one of those inflections that just take this to such an oddball level you can't help but laugh at the misery and again maybe that's all you can do in such a in such a case well it's the idea that laughing sometimes is the best medicine and and that's what this song is doing while also coming from a gloaty perspective no i'd argue that it's more you're what are gone. you arguing that laughing no, no. is the best medicine no no, no. i don't think it's <laughs> saying that at all it's no not... it's not saying anything i'm saying i'm saying that laughter is the best medicine and this song makes you laugh and that's a good thing Oh, Especially okay. on this track through the progression. The fact of the matter is that you can't really identify any other reason why he would choose to be so so lighthearted yeah. about it and have yeah. such a an, laughter an open... is wonderful medicine, but whiskey don't suck either. That's <laughs> also very true. Which he also addresses. So he's coming at this from multiple angles. Um but and in fact that's another thing the final line references my guilty conscience and a frozen broken heart. That combo platter does it every single time. So again, it's just multiple things kind of getting you to the same... I don't know. There's this odd thing about this album where I can never exactly pin down when he's being uh, when he's being real and when he's not. And I think I enjoy that. That's no, the funny yeah. thing. That's, it speaks to what I was saying it's earlier. Tr- like, and, and, and that that shows a certain mastery in songwriting that yeah. you can create that ambiguity where you're like guessing a little bit. He's making you think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's good. You should, you should be made to think by the music you listen to. Mm-hmm. The next track that we go to from here is uh, Harmless, which is the only cover on the record. Um, it was originally done by Michael Mara, and he's covering it here. Um, and this is where we go back to... Apparently this Michael Mara is with us no more. Ah, okay. Been looking up some credits here. This was extremely similar to uh, what we got in, in like Depression Blues, but... This the, is more of a rock difference. and roll feel, though, than blues here, I feel like. No, no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to argue that. I'm going to say yeah. it's it's still a lot closer to Depression Blues um, and in a hurry than than anything else. But the, the big difference, I think, is just the vocals. The vocals are mm-hmm. so much tighter, uh, so much antithesis of that gravel we got earlier. Yeah. It, it's clean. It's, it's, it's big. This is like... But yeah, it wavers I can sing at like high levels. Yeah. It's got it's, it's very open, very and, open and clean tone. It's what I would call kind of my a te- no, my a noble would style to of this singing. And yeah, well, because it's going along with the theme of the song, which mm-hmm. is harmless and this gentle mm-hmm. giant kind of feel. We we were making allusions yeah. to Fezzik. Yeah, we earlier. decided this song is totally a Fezzik song, and and there is a, on on the on the cover of this album they have a famous sad clown. His name I forget, but I think he's referenced somewhere in the lyrics. He is, um, and and it's very much that feel of somebody who's like, you know, a, a, a gentle giant. Somebody who's big feet, big hands, whatever, but very gentle, harmless, wouldn't hurt a fly, and that sort of Walter Mitty life that this person has. And what and I like that it's, John- it's, it's it's like never overtly all that sad about it until no. like the very end there's something about no one would miss me if I never came home for tea <laughs> and and what I also like though like speaking kind of gives a little sorry no no it's okay um, no I agree it kind of like turns the blade at the end almost like that gives a little gets, twist gets twist uh-huh. Uh, but what John was saying earlier, though, about how his vocals really shine here, I mean, I feel like it even shines more in the choruses because he gets this emotional breath that you really mm-hmm. get to see his, his the, the depth of his singing ability. And it adds an emotionality to this track also on another level. Yeah, no, it's got this gentle warmth all throughout. Um, again, also, I think it was aided the fact the song was like in a nice like 6-8, sort of a slow 6-8, mm-hmm. and has these long, drawn-out tones on the violin, mm-hmm. which also kind of provide a nice backdrop. And it tends to kind of change it up, uh, not evenly. For instance, it's not just a long tone that lasts the entirety of the 6-8 measure. Instead, it's more of like a 1-2-3, changes up right on the end of the 3. So you get kind of this overlapping, like what uh, violins often do in order to maintain a smooth tone if for instance there were more than one violin then you get an orchestra that tries to kind of interchange the bowing over each other that way you maintain the illusion of a smooth thing what actually stood out to me on this track is when the accordion kicks in over it doing this sort of da 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 almost sort of a calliope Mm -hmm. sound and it reminded me a little bit of a sort of french cafe music um sort of the musette uh, music of France, which was sort of a big influence on Django Reinhardt and Gypsy Swing, and you get a little bit of that sort of French cafe, like Parisian feel. Yeah, and actually, which, which is which is a nice touch, and and also blends to the sort of you know 
Sunday afternoon strolling by the banks of the Seine. Very, that very was another gentle. thing I noted. This that track is incredibly gentle and I called simple it, and, and soft and sweet. I called it kind of a troubadour style. It's like, mm. I guess, borrowed down from that because I guess like... You might be thinking Jacques Brel and that kind of thing. Perhaps. That all goes back to A lot of those things like, sort of borrowed from that and yeah. brought it into that like bohemian French uh, mm. atmosphere. Like... Again, talking about very romantic themes and mm-hmm. describing a lot of nature and that whole smooth... That was my first impression of, of, of this, actually, before I moved to, like, the noble style of singing. Um, but altogether, I mean, th- these are really, really beautiful lyrics that, of course, culminate in just that simple chorus, harmless, harmless, and the quiver present just mm-hmm. on that word alone. I mean, you find it just kind of getting stuck in your head uh, as it, it defines the track as it goes. Take a couple of verses here. Does he, does he wish he wasn't harmless? Say again? Do no. you think he wishes he wasn't harmless if he feels maybe... If I could no. Just a little more... Like, like a, a certain bit of woe, for instance, in that well, kind in of that woe word? is me, like, you know, or not... I mean, harmless me basically means he has no effect on anything. Yeah, I would equate this to something sad. as, like, was... Mr. Cellophane. But I the, mean, I feel yeah, like it's it it's, totally it's a is spiritual, Mr. So- that it's is a spiritual a successor to it. Absolutely, there's, dude. Good call. It's there's There's no desire to go... F- and be a bigger person. This guy is content with where he is in life. Yeah, I guess, well, Mr. Sullivan. I think there's a maybe, hint of maybe not. Con- it's yeah, a bit of there's a hint of sadness. Well, there's a hint of sadness well, let's all take over it, this let's album. Take Come it from on. the from the lyrics themselves. My heart is um, in my mouth with arms that could reach over the sea. My feet might be big, but the insects are safe. They'll never they'll never get stood on by me. Harmless, harmless. There's no, there's never no bother for me. I go to the library, take out a book, then I come home for my tea. Save all the coupons that come with the soup. When I have saved 53, I send away 50, put three in the drawer. Something gets posted to me. Again, it's kind of back to these simple themes here. But it, especially, I'm looking back to the thing of the insects. But the insects are safe. They'll never get stood on by me. Like, I don't think that he thinks he is harmless at the same... I mean... Maybe there's woe with the fact that he is harmless. Excuse yeah. me, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, yeah. It, there's a hint of it. I don't think that he's. It's like that's the focus, but there's definitely a hint of it in the way it's sung and the. the in a lyrics. very removed sense, I describe yeah. it to the nice guys finished last idea. Yeah, I can a little see bit. That. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, obviously with with know, more the, the, literary it's, color, it's, but <laughs> it's painting a picture of a life most of us would find a little bit pathetic, a little bit bleak. Yeah, and yeah. Very, very mundane. Bland. Very. Uh, a very Willy Loman kind of, kind of. Well, I was going for Walter Mitty, but same thing. It's okay. Similar, yeah. Moreover, um, uh, the main character from Fargo. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Played by what's his name? Yes, a very pathetic Mace existence. Mason. That's it. Exactly. Um, from There's here. one or two. Oh, just one more thing here. I needed to isolate this. There's yeah, one or two I. lads that I could call my chums. They're Kenny and Meek as can be. There's Tom with his pigeons and Will with his mice and Robert McLennan and me. Oh, this reads like a limerick. Yeah. And again, the very sad limerick. The mm-hmm. idea that you are just simple environment, very little to it. You are never going to be a hero and there's nothing to this. Again, back to that existential idea. Just a different direction he's taking here than from earlier. I yeah. just, I, I love it from a thematic perspective. I was going to say, thematically, there's a pretty strong through line in this record and everything. So he's pretty yeah. connected. And, and this, I think this kind of ties into that whole, like, growing old thing. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, I'm kind of an old man now. Nobody's, he's, you know, a dog with no teeth. Yeah, kind of a thing. <laughs> no, no bite left and just bark. Well, if you're going to start talking about dogs, we might as well move on to track seven, Men and Dog. May so, I include a segue here? Because yes, this can is segue. a little bit important. Again, the that final... That was a segue. The, the, I know, I, I know. I, I know, you're stepping all over it. I am stepping all over it because there's Damn one more Damn your thing. eyes, sir. Damn your eyes. No, in fact, I encourage you to use your segue first. Men and Dog is a jug short of a jug band. I think there might be a jug towards the end there. Yeah, they it eventually does come They in. pull out the spoons and the whistle and all the stuff. They definitely have all the fixins for, for a classic jug band, which what? I love. From <laughs> uh, the say. mouth harmonica? The uh, jaw mouth harp or Jew's harp. Okay. Jaw harp, basically. That thing. What I like about this song is it harkens back also to track two, spaced in in the phrasing of the humor. It's a play. There's a lot of play on words, and it it, it adds for comedy. Also about very urban or city life, but this is about a man and dog, man and his best friend. And it goes further than that to also include the control of the inflection, the control of the pacing of the vocals and lyrical work. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's frankly, I think this might be like 
bar none, the best metaphor on the entire album. Because uh, very apparently and with such perfect analogies, he's describing a man and his dog living in the city. But this becomes just an allegorical tale of how man fits into the rest of the world, into his setting around him. What the dog represents as a companion that's always there, his conscience in some instances, or the sh- in, in, in one very dis- find instant the shit he's got to pick up afterwards i mean it is <laughs> yeah life the dog as much as uh-huh. it's uh what he takes care of it's also just his life well, what, there's an interesting reference here musically because there's um sorry i don't mean to, we'll, we'll get back to the dog stuff i promise because I, I do love it um there was um the bits at the end where he has sort of like you know man man in the park walking with the dog it kind of references uh, Talking Blues, which was the kind of thing that Woody Guthrie and then Bob Dylan did an awful lot of, the sort of early Talking Blues, and they go like, um, well, I won't try to sing an example, I will I will mess it up. But it, it it's kind of, re- and, you know, this is a guy who's been in the folk scene since the 60s, so it's sort of like looking back at his own history musically, but putting a very different twist on it. It's definitely... A more modern thing, even though he's had that really old timey jug band feel on a lot of it, it's still a contemporary song. And and the kind of humor that you usually get in talking blues is very much evident. The sort of little tags at the end of the line. Yeah, well and also I feel like the sound effects probably mm-hmm. added that a bit with like the dogs barking and yeah. howling and whining adds to the comedy as well. And and, and something w- was interesting, uh the the little bits where he's got these like harmonies which yeah. starts drawing them out for almost comic effects. It's kind of kind of like bluegrassy three-part harmonies. It really reminds me of some of the recent stuff Steve Martin's been doing. Yes. His bluegrass stuff, which tends to also incorporate his own comedy. And then he screws up those harmonies with a little bit of yowling and barking in yeah. the background. I love it. It's, it? it's, it's, it's that another little level of meta he throws into the mix that's going on here. Well, that yeah. those sound effects are actually reminiscent to me of something I kind of grew up with but like it reminds me it harkens back to a Dr. Demento kind of age too yeah it's almost Spike Jones. almost Spike Jones in the co- comedy but not aspect so of the much song. that that takes over and it's just about novelty sounds and wacko it's no just like, it's just a little just sp- enough of it to be like yeah we're being silly here yeah but not like oh look at us how silly we are well I have to consider the fact that this track is sort of breaking uh and this, this is the segue that I've been holding back here, because it's not really much of a segue. There was a very important line at the very end of the previous track, and that is simply the fact that he didn't come home from tea. Essentially, he, we're coming from such that existential environment where he claimed that he was so worthless, nobody noticed I wasn't there if I didn't come home from my tea. So that's, what, that's where the last track left a song, and then all of a sudden he kind of whisks us back like snap slingshotting us back to the everyday life scene so he's he's done this like three different times in the record where we've gone to the morgue then we're back he's always this this pattern of finding a very mundane environment where he's essentially worthless or there's a a depiction of something that everyone sees there's no heroism there no present none present whatsoever and then all of a sudden a what if i died right now like this, this constant concern as he goes through the record, which I find very bleak, but he always incorporates the mundane scenes with a degree of laughter before he, or, or he flips it up. He'll incorporate those with a degree of laughter, or maybe he'll incorporate the death with a degree of laughter. Either way, sometimes he's serious, sometimes he's not from a musical standpoint. That's if, what I find interesting. Here. If you want to talk about that last line, if I don't come home from my tea, well, this is the answer. His dog's going to miss him. <laughs> That's what he well, does. Depression blues. <laughs> looking for the end, looking for the end, trying to find a way to do it. And then death. I mean, he's trying to build... Not trying. He is building a point and counterpoint to each of the, 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 the dealings mm-hmm. of each of his songs. Call and response. It's, very traditional blues technique. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's a true. back the and forth. The old-timey guy approves. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, doing a, he's having a tete-a-tete with himself. That's what I noticed. Nice SAT word. Thank you. I like it. I <laughs> he use uses it often. <laughs> he uses it pretty frequently. And in like Band and Dog, I feel like it's, it's actually a great follow-up to Harmless. I don't mm-hmm. see any sort of disconnect thematically because 
He's talking. No, that's not what he's I was, not I was that I oh, okay. never claimed that. No, I oh, said. Oh, I thought that's what you were going with it. All I, all I did was describe the tete tete, and then you termed it the tete tete, which I applaud you for. Oh, okay. I thought you were <laughs> arguing that it wasn't good. Way to go, uh, way to argue, John. Way to argue with yourself. Well, <laughs> he started talking in circles. Um, <laughs> I think from here we can safely go on to Harlan County. Yeah. So we go. Okay. We go into an old timey folk sound here. Very. I believe. I believe this is what the experts call rubato. Yeah. Um, well, no. <laughs> I don't think Damn so. It. I don't think that's the word. Yeah, I thought I was being all clever. Um, so this folk sound is very reminiscent of... Uh, this is pretty free straightforward. Meter. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, free meter. Another There's a word for that. I don't know. I felt it... Uh, maybe that's why I'm, I'm disagreeing with Roboto. In that case, you had the right concept. I just didn't feel this freer. I felt it was still kind of tight, but it kind of went back to the... Yeah, but not really on a beat. Um... Maybe just by the fact that it's speed. a little bit ones. slower. Yeah. I, I compared it very closely to Harmless, frankly. I felt it was in the very it was kind of in the same vein. It just covers a different subject. And this time it's alcohol. And, and the it's, lack of it. In in Harlan <laughs> yeah. County. And this is this is like really old timey. I love this track because it references that kind of Appalachian folk that I've been into for for many years now and have been like But it talks about into and, you know and going, it, Going and, up into the mountains on your ATV, finding smoky and shooting them for a six pack. It talks about the fact that well, you, it's easier to get meth because they cook it right there in Harlan County than it is yeah. to get alcohol. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's talking it's about anti nostalgic, and I applaud that. It's, it's but but it's bo- both in terms of talking about Harlan County, which has a lot of sort of, and he mentions you know Cumberland, so like the Cumberland Gap in North Carolina, Kentucky area, like Harlan County, I think is where the Stanley Brothers are from. And they have the in. Their version of Shady Grove, they go, Shady Grove, my little love, Shady Grove, my darling, Shady Grove, my little love, I'm going back to Harlan. It's also so it's like worked into their songs and some TV show or Justify. something. Justify, right? Yeah. Don't, don't, be, don't be, it's a great show. You should I've never it. seen it. I'll check it's, it out. It's a very enjoyable show. Awesome. Um, which kind of like deals with this song almost entirely. Uh, it's, it's... It's good, but at this point, I'm not really feeling it musically. It just seems like, well, we're once again getting another rendition of another thing that happened decades ago. Yeah, but this folk was a little different from what we got earlier in the record. And also what I like is we we sit in the old-timey sound long enough, and then after the lyrics end, we get a little kind of party outro, where it's kind of like a jug band dance in a bar. Well, well, that, the, the, the thing is, I kind of, I kind of feel like it's it's a bit of a curtain pulling aside reveal it's yeah. like you feel that like it's 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 a contemporary folk song that has strains of it's referencing that kind of Appalachian culture and some of the sounds in it and then you know it's got that kind of high lonesome sound in the harmonies and the way it's done and then in the outro it's got a, a proper like old time fiddle tune the way yeah. I kind of interpreted this like, so like here's the roots of this like the actual thing that you would hear in Harlan County 50 years ago, maybe. Speaking to that, speaking to that, that section that he brings in the end, the mm. way I kind of interpreted this is sort of, he spends his time trying to, of course, find alcohol and being very disappointed mm. by the region around him. The Cumberland Gap is known for being pretty strict, like, you know, forget about the no alcohol on Sundays. A lot of times there's that, 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 that sort of Appalachian region can be very, very strict with this. It's actually sometimes hard to find even in the modern world. Um, forget about the times in which if, if he's actually being period periodical with this, then, of course, it which, might be completely talking dry. about ATVs and cooking meth. He's oh, of not, course, then, of course, I mean, if you go there, no, this is about. But when you think the style of it, it's just like it can almost like sweep to any any time in like awesome. Appalachian well, last but, 150 years. But the, the shift I'm talking about is specifically when he when he goes up toward the mountains and then it's all of a sudden there, it's the less like government-controlled Appalachia. And it seems like he pretty much stumbled upon his alcohol-serving venue, and that's when he brings in the sort of the, the full-on square dance at the, the end. The fiddle tune, so yeah. So, yeah. it, it, it was a successful journey, essentially. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in there somewhere. You go deep into the hollows, you'll find it. And um, there's a really great book, actually, Chasing the White Dog, all about uh, moonshine in contemporary America. Recommend to anybody. <laughs> awesome. And Wait, moonshine or the book? Moonshine. Well... Depends who made the moonshine. I'm just recommending the book. Okay, I, I enjoy prohibition culture in general and the whole the whole uh, history yeah, of it. And the raw and whiskey the, is, is yeah. um, doesn't quite measure up to a properly aged bourbon. I'd say it's <laughs> fun sometimes for the experience, but 
it uh, tends to be a bit rough. Yeah, but I address the old timey environment here, at least just in the tone of the final section, mm, because sure. of the square dance environment. I mean, it's got spoons, you got fiddle, it's it's got everything you want at a mm-hmm. alcohol serving venue. From here, we go to a very personal track on the record. But something I want to talk about a little bit before we get to it is we've we've reviewed a lot of albums over the last couple of years where an artist who wasn't always a father as a musician became a father mm-hmm. and wrote a song about their young child telling them where they come from, how much they mean, blah, blah, blah. A sappy track that can kind of hit or miss because it's more personal for the artist regardless of what the fan finds. Whereas this, I Knew Your Mother, is also, he's writing this for his son Rufus, but what I think is hilarious is that Painless shared with us, it's for his 40th birthday. So <laughs> his son's an adult, and he's still telling him about his mother, and there's innuendo abound. It's still yeah, very he says, sweet. I knew your mother in the biblical sense. Yeah. He, and, he makes it very like, yeah, I did your mom. And, and, it's, every, and he, he hammed it up so much in that when he did it live, it was great. It strikes me as the kind of joke that he could... I mean, especially considering the, the style of humor that he has. He could have been doing this throughout his entire son's life. Just oh, he like definitely was. Oh, most I'm, certainly I'm was, yeah. guessing this was no big surprise when he pulled it out at the party. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, If I'm not mistaken, I believe said. his daughter was singing backup with him, too, which is another she, little yeah, little, little one of twinge his, to his One to of his, his son. daughters was singing some of the backup. It depends... I don't know if it was on this song specifically. Some some of the tracks I read somewhere uh, was this song e- specifically. Efo yeah. Donovan of Crooked Still does a lot of backup on this album. Um, but this one, this song is upbeat. It's uh, got a beach rock feel. It's not sway worthy. Surf almost. rock, beach oh, rock, almost I mean, like uh, Queen Sunday Afternoon. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I would hear that comparison. Sort of a parading down the boardwalk feel, a little bit silly. And what's almost, f- almost Beatles. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just got more of a pop leaning, I think, Almost than like other. when I'm 64 kind yeah. of feel. Certainly, you know the the, the pop novelty. Mm-hmm. It's and 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 on, honestly, the music's a bit vanilla on this one. And but I think it's supposed to be. Yeah, the lyrics, I think, what sell it, and it's got a sincerity and how kind of matter of fact he's singing about pretty much yeah. how he did his son's mom. You know, it's it's it adds it's to clouded it in the mystery of well, don't forget, love was the means and you were the end, which is a kind of a sweet way to put it when you yeah. think about it. Uh-huh. I mean, that's not so much a yeah, yeah I did and the and mom. It, it, I, it's well, it's interesting because the relationship with his wife uh, Kate McGarrigal um, did not last, and he kind of references you know it lasted as long as it could. So, you know, it's like he's also talking about how there was, you know, trouble and strife, but sweet points and calm and reflecting on that relationship as much as he is telling his his son about his young days. And And the punchline is ultimately, you know, you came because of this. You know, his son is the punchline of the song, essentially, is that, you know, he was the... That's a really good way to put it, actually. would not want to be the punchline of his dad's song? Yeah. (laughs) Well, and, yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. There's more innuendo there, of course, and you have to endure it if you're the son. I knew your mother, and your mother knew me, and as long as it lasted, it's as long have as it could be. Have you heard the kind of songs Rufus sings? <laughs> yeah. You know, he I goes think pretty he's far. okay with it. And I think, but there's not a lot much beyond that to talk about with this song. It, but what I like about this one is a lot of the other songs where we've heard from father to son or mother to daughter, they're they're a little more showy and less sincere, whereas this is very sincere, even in its silliness. And it's what makes it, I think it gives it more heart than a lot of other songs we've heard in this vein. Yeah, no, this is this is one of those tracks, it's just, I know it's kind of a little bit of the filler for this album. I, I, I have to leave it at that. Yeah. But it's, it's, we've had this in time and time again, whenever you identify a track that is meant for another person, not necessarily for the audience, but the audience can still enjoy it in that right, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Well, if you want filler... We get we're allowed to ten. <laughs> yeah, so ten. Looking at the calendar, I wouldn't see this as filler necessarily. Well, I I feel it is a bit of a misstep. He does the whole like, it sounds an awful lot like a. It uh, sounds what, like a collective is, soul, yeah, soul asylum, like alt rock. Musically, right? musically, I'm going to agree with the filler. And comment. and the fact, I mean, yeah, the the words are cute. He's sort of this idea of like. We're looking at the calendar and like we can't break up at Christmas. That would be horrible because it would mess up. We got it. We can't, you know, 
you need two people to prop up the tree and you can't break up during Easter because of the Sinatra's making all these excuses. And also well, just because of the way you, we structure yeah. our calendar. It's just like, wow, it would really suck to have to be dealing with that during the holidays. So if but you just get through it and find an off but day. The, the way the way the the way the lyrics play out, the structure of the lyrics and then the melody behind it, it's just not quite as tight as some of his other writing on the album. Oh. And then like having that kind of like nineties rock backtrack is like it's like what I hate about a lot of Todd Snyder albums. Like he sounds so much better when he's just like this could have been much better if it was just him and the guitar. It's in a very southern like the, the, rock vein, and I think yeah, that's the problem. Is that such silly. a that is it's sort of a silly. misstep for the album because well, it's not it's, anything he's been doing so far. And it, it fur, feel, further, it than, feels forced, and the other things don't feel forced. Well, further it, than just this, first, further than just the um, uh, like the southern rock style, it takes that to kind of go with like a sound of like a radio rendition of a Christmas song. Because of course, a lot of, most of this is centered on Christmas. Well, why shouldn't, we, we shouldn't really break up at Christmas. He now notes other holidays like Thanksgiving, Christmas, and then you uh, finally all, Christmas for yeah. number 11. He's like, well, maybe we'll do it on April Fool's. <laughs> well, the, that's the cheap shot I really did in line. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the punchline it builds the, too just wasn't as good as some of the other stuff on the record. It could have gone the opposite route and just not done a punchline. Yeah. It could have just gone, well, I guess we can't break up. Like, that could have been the punchline. I guess. I mean, either one would have been kind of expected. I think as a whole, the song just doesn't have enough meat on the hook. It's there's I would some... have liked better, I guess, references. Eh, I, that wouldn't have no, even saved it, you, I don't think. Because the music want, was no, no, too... No, 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 you want, no. I def- you that's do... what I started this on. I defended on that notion. I think it had a pretty good premise. The main issue I have is the, is the route that it shows. Well, it's like, okay... I, Southern rock, but again, a radio rendition of like a Christmas rock song, the which are always hits. as cheesy as you can possibly as you can possibly make it. Greatest hits of the Eagles, modern era type. Still I mean, about it's... looking at the calendar. Uh, yeah, we're still talking. We no, no, we're no, still, no, still talking about that. Yeah. Okay, because they seem to have a disagreement. <laughs> it's it's These I don't know. It just didn't. The best of families. It didn't culminate in any way to really have one element stand out above the others. It was just meh. I think we can all say Enjoyable. Please. It's a complete song. I, I mean, it didn't just... After so much, like, really good satire throughout the rest of the album, it came off a little bit weaker here. I think we can I'm all... Gonna, I'm going to end this the way I started baked. It. Yes. I'm going to end this the way I started, and that is simply the fact that from a musical standpoint, I think this was very, very weak, but I do defend the idea. I like the fact of saying... It, it's too cruel to break up at Christmas because I think that's an important message that a lot of people really do time their lives by their calendars Mm -hmm. or by the existing calendar. I think that's an important subject. And I think also more importantly than that, it still fits the theme because this can still cause a lot of sorrow and depression. So it still fits that. Well, then now we're just kind of like dipping around into various areas of depression, which I admit is a little bit uh, looser than what we had. Moving on to track 11 in the vein of mentioning Christmas, it's called I'll Be Killing You This Christmas. Now, this is my, very different. So I have an yeah. issue with this song up front. My issue with this song up front is that it's, it's, it's intentionally cliche, but I don't know that it, 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 needs, it serves any purpose on the record other than fitting the theme, sort of. It, it's very well written word-wise. Lyrically, it is very sharp. It's it's so mm. sharp he cuts himself on his own wit here. Mm, it is true. too far for just the groundwork because the satire is almost non-existent at points. You don't know if he's being serious. And the way some of these lines read, it's a little bit too serious, a little bit too scary. When he starts taking pot shots at the NRA, they don't even really sound like Pot shots. It sounds like he's really agreeing with some very conservative yeah, right wing he, Second Amendment ideas. It's very deadpan. And, and the problem is that musically it's deadpan too. It's this classic cheesy Christmas it's song with, with, with the that, jingle bells it, coming in and the soft sleigh like, bells, yeah. You know, that Bing Crosby jazz and the strings. And, and, the and pure the, classical and you just, voice I, inflection is and the I other just, thing. I'm waiting for a little bit of wonkiness because yeah. I hate those Christmas songs. I mean, some people love them, I know. Well, the wonkiness is, of course, the turn of I phrase. And, <laughs> I mean, that's so. fair enough. And that's what I... Uh, it's sort of but like indicted other with songs, the last track. But it, yeah. it shares that in common with the last track. But if you're looking at... At the subject matter, I think maybe this could be considered a little bit cleverer than the previous track. Because after all, the previous track... Oh, yeah. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. No, the lyrics here are much better. It's just... 
I wish I didn't have to listen to this song to get those lyrics. I agree with what John was saying. <laughs> I think that the 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 words he is yes he still has sharp wit like he's had more sharp wit than the last track, but the music again in this track for me is what kills it. Just but that's I what hear that's it. what gives it its wit. wit. That's yeah, what gives it its. Let's its be on the nose here. I I I I can't beat around the bush anymore. I mean, it's, I'll be killing you this Christmas. Tis the season you must die. No, there's no way you'll miss this. A Bushmaster's on my wish list. My right to bear arms you cannot deny. I'll be shooting folks this Christmas, but there's no need to be worried or alarmed. What's wrong with a handgun when everyone else has one? Which is why there's no need to be armed. I Look, this is one of those things that is bound to inflame you if you are on a certain side. Yeah. Um, if you're on the other side, I think you're going to perceive it as extremely clever. And then, of course, you need to consider the fact that maybe he's doing this really underhanded satire thing, and you need to kind of step over the other side and think about that in the aftermath. It's, I'm, I'm inclined to just pull back and say it's clever all around for making you think what, like, oh, yeah. how the other side kind of addresses the subject. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the subject that raises despite the controversy. I think that's what I but, like about this track, despite even the, the Christmas backdrop, which, frankly, I found cheesier in the previous track, musically, than in this track. This is just dead on, and I think it works on that level. Well, the fact that it is just a Christmas song in the musical level is what makes everything else work for this song. Yes. You're that's, absolutely right. There's yeah. no way to deny that. It's just there's all these little issues there that are piling up some here. some kind of happy medium where you could do something. Yeah. Just tweak the... Christmas song formula. Maybe go a little point. bit different. Replace a few instruments. Throw in Morocco's Have instead of sleigh bells. Yeah. Like do something weird. Yeah. Do something that will match up with the off kilter nature of the lyrics themselves. Say, for instance, what he did with Just "Man and weird. Dog." Yeah. Man yeah. and Dog, like incorporating the dog sounds. It's like okay, you're taking him on the journey. Well, it's like well, maybe I don't know if you want to take him on the journey through, say, shooting up people around Christmas time. I don't know if that would be. Uh, uh, here, here's a here's and I, and I don't know if. Loud and the Third has ever put out a Christmas album, but part of me kind of doubts, and I wonder if, like, if in any other situation he would have played this kind of music, if not mm. to parody Christmas. Yeah, but and that, not- that's that's part of the part of the problem here, in terms of, just in terms of the music, because like other songs are funny and silly and making jokes and stuff. Grandma but got run over. I mean, yeah, that's but a it's perfect still... comedy Christmas song. Well, which is well, why I'm inclined to kind of just take this back and look at it in the span of the album, which is, of course, all right, he's addressed yeah. Christmas in various ways by now. He's clearly obsessed with the concept. And I think this is his way of sort of saying, look, if I'm in this frame of mind, this, this very depressed, uh, existentially harrowing frame of mind that is kind of eating me right and left, and I'm playing around with the notion from various standpoints, then you arrive at this track, and now all of a sudden it incorporates guns that's a dangerous place to be in but he hasn't he hasn't yet avoided to be on the nose why should he stop now no that's fair like i said i think my biggest issue with the track is i just don't like it and it's a personal preference at that point it's not he did anything wrong necessarily because again everything that we've said so far and what john said at the beginning the wit is enhanced by the music it would fall shorter without it it i think this track very candidly implies that he was that there's there was a breakup around christmas time um, and <laughs> again, there's the notion going through your head. I mean, it gets a little is, crazy. This is the kind of like classic, you know, person who snaps. Yes. Yeah. Like somebody. This is weird. Don't house, the night Santa. Yeah. 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 It's Don't post it. We just. I mean, we've talked about therapy early in this album. Again, it makes sense that it would arrive at this point. Let's uh, go from here to a not Christmas related anything anymore. Although, then I guess if you... Hallelujah. No, there's Amen. still there's still Christmas. God and nature. <laughs> if you're talking from a religious aspect. That's aspect. true. This back to blues. Been nice a, slow down. I'm bit happy. Of a Bible thumper. This one. Yeah, I wish I wasn't expecting. But Although it wasn't it's... just being a Bible thumper. It was. It. I kind of sum it up as he said, telling people, "Don't be a dick." Yeah, it's kind of like the the actual good part. Yeah, yeah. It's something that something golden that he's, rule here. Something that he's found in there that resonates. Well, I, certainly... I, I was sort of waiting for something to be like. Where was the punchline? Irony or sarcasm to creep in, and it wasn't. This this is sincere. The sincere part especially comes when you address the eventual God. Yeah. Um, So, like, yes, it's the good parts, but it is, they'll strike you down for sure, make no mistake. Mm. Lies and lust catch up with us, sure as the sun must rise. There's an apple in the garden and a snake. It it is very on point, and I don't think there's any beating around the bush here. Uh, But 
it is, it's, it's helpful, I guess. It's just weird to come from all the, you know, the different layers that I'm ascribing to the previous tracks, and then this, I really got nothing. Well, it could be a summation, because we are winding down on the album, mm-hmm. of, of, of what all the previous stuff were, was trying to what, get across. Is there a lesson? Is there Here's a the lesson. Away? Don't be a dick. Well, I think that's more than that also. When you're in an extreme emotional state of any kind, and in this case we're, we're talking about depression a lot, some people turn to religion. Yeah. No, right. in that case, mm-hmm. you're simply saying yeah. that the madness that you left at the previous track is, is opened up here into enlightenment. Yeah. Or Perhaps. better yet, he's trying to talk help. himself down from the previous track. Man, trying another to find answer to that finding some kind of salvation I yeah. I from this stuff. And I think it adds an yeah. interesting dichotomy, too, to the previous track. You know, whereas the other one was very aggressive and this one's more subdued and just kind of searching for answers. Ah, a little bit scary, scared as well. There, right. There's that. There's the... A little bit the, of Calvinist dread going on here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is a very old time. Mm-hmm. You know, it fits with the stuff. And it, it's got the... You know, there were a lot of blues songs about, you know, gonna get me some religion, join the Baptist church, all that but kind here, of thing. So for, the, for sure, Sun though. did a lot of those. For sure, though, if you just look at Beware the Seeds You Sow, you can apply it to anybody, you know, secular yeah, yeah. or otherwise. Yeah, and uh, I think that's the purpose that this serves. And again, it's uh, I like how both John and, and Painless framed it. It's it's Bible-thumping, but it's the good parts. It's not someone in your face telling you what you yeah. should do. It's expressing what he kind of feels about it, and mm. but not in a No, it face still goes way. there. I'm just saying, if you think about it broadly, mm-hmm. you, it, is, it is both. <laughs> yeah. but, one, one, but it's not really... Enticing me musically, it's not really enticing it me is, lyrically. It's, it is a little bit stale. Preachy, ultimately, musically, I liked it a lot. There's a jazzy banjo, so the jazzy Outside banjo, the and banjo? then jazzy mandolin. Um, Tony Trishka played banjo on this track, and he's he's a luminary in the banjo world. Um, I looked it up while everybody was talking about something else. <laughs> the banjo but, uh, really it's, it's, is the high point of this song. Yeah, it's a great banjo. But wow. outside it's like of that, doing that kind of bluesy. St- Jazzy stuff is is nice to hear. There's some very interesting tonal touch. Yeah, I felt like lyrically this this didn't really like. It it's was almost, it was earnest, but in a way that like is it felt not less giving sincere. me something good. It's 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 kind of like it's preaching as opposed to it doesn't have the empathy that some of the other stuff had. This is what I meant by the duality. As I when I cited the line, "Beware the seeds you sow." Well, okay, that's broad. That any any everyone should incorporate that into their lives. Mm-hmm. But then of course there's well, be sure your sins will find you out, and that's what the good book says. Well, it brings it back constantly. So yeah. there is of course the religious element, the, specifically the Christian element, and it's like, well, all right, all right. There's nothing terribly wrong with that. It's no. just, you know, you you need to be on that side of the fence. That's it. Um Let's go to track 13. I haven't got the blues yet. This is the title track. Uh, and important to uh, mention the parenthesis around the yet, because th- and this track kind of explains, of course, what the what the album, I think, is looking at. There's a lot of things that people are depressed over, which I guess if you, again, stand back, look at your life, you need to maybe address the concept of first word problems first world problems sure i think that's mm-hmm. kind of what this is looking at but it's also this idea that it's it, it's i haven't, haven't got the blues yet is this idea that you can kind of see them coming but you're mm-hmm. not quite there yet you're falling into this depression but you're not Maybe. depressed i yet. mean what i was kind of getting from it is is sort of this is a bit of a parody of the character it's a it's a yeah. sort of a caricature this guy it's a very kind of a nightclub singer feel to it yeah and and the character it's like he he can't he wants to like sing the blues and be all deep and, and be all fucked up and everything. <laughs> but but he's yet. just his life is a little too good. Yeah. If it's well, your job yeah. to sing the blues and you're just not always there, that's a problem. So sometimes yeah, you it's like reach. it's it's like somebody who like you grow up on this music and like, you know, I mean, I can take my example. I, I love this like old timey southern stuff. I'm not from the South, I'm from Israel. Mm-hmm. I likened it you to You know, middle class Jewish kid, like many other middle class Jewish kids over the years, like David Grisman and um, Harry Saposnik and Andy Statman and many other fantastic bluegrass players have been drawn to this music. It's completely alien to my background and my upbringing, and and it's sort of you kind of find your find your way to deal with that weird dichotomy of like you're into something that is not part of your own tradition, or you know not a result of your socioeconomic position in life. Mm-hmm. Which, which is implied in the blues that you got the blues because you're way down there. Well, I also on, on take it wrong. from just like looking at what the blues represent itself. I mean, the blues, 
as a music form, it tends to look at very, very depressing subjects while、mm. sometimes taking that old country route where it kind of is a little bit. It's a little bit too positive for what the subject you know, might otherwise justify.、Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's unfortunate, maybe, for like, reeling a lot of people into the blues because they think, well, the blues is just this stereotypical idea of, of pursuing misery or, or、mm-hmm. conveying misery. And it never really、no. seems to for what, a lot of people. What, what it people is have found about, it in other ways. I, I, I think at its core, the blues was an outlet. It was people who were seriously in situations where. Try as they might, work as hard as they can, they can't really get out of the bad situation they are in life because of the system they were in, because、mm-hmm. of their environment, because of the cart and take a stack against them. So they can't fix it, they can't shake the blues. What they have left to do is commiserate, is get together and sing about it, and just like share the experience and try to, you know. Pass around the burden so you're carrying it together. That Thus, is... like the second you start actually singing and playing music, well, you're already a little bit out of it. Music has done its job, essentially. But, I mean,、mm. it's, and I guess maybe that's kind of what this is going for. I think it's just that, that、uh, addressing the fact that, well, blues aren't always the most deadened、yeah. form of art. And frankly, as you're singing it, you're realizing maybe you're not at the very bottom,、yeah. but, you, but you're still caught up in the art form. The、there's、art form has its own volition. With things like blues and some other forms of music, there's questions of cultural tourism, artist, you know, sort of cultural appropriation that often get raised. And I think this is sort of poking a bit of fun at that. <laughs> Which I'm sure it's something that he's come across. One of my favorite、career. lines here was、mm. Hold up in my living room. As for, as for my composure, it's in the lost and found.、Mm. As if to say, well, you can take it back at any point. In other words, all these things are fixable, is what he's saying here.、Mm-hmm. It's、yeah. like, well, that's not, that's not irreparable. That's,、yeah. It's there. All I have to do is go and get it, and then it's back. In yeah, other words, yeah, he you know knows the routine. Common People by Pulp? No, that's not familiar.、Ah, never mind. That's a good reference. It's a.、Uh... William Shatner did a great cover of it on Has Been.、Um, Sounds like a good reference. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, this guy like, meets this rich girl from Greece whose dad is loaded, and she's like, I want to live like common people. I want to do what common people do. And he's like, You could never get it right, even if you did the whole thing. Because one call to your dad, and it would all be over. You always have an out, you always have an escape. And really having the blues and singing the blues is when you don't have a parachute.、Yeah. You don't have a way out. There is no, you know. Pause button on it. There's one line, though, I need to address there. It's one of those, like, again, these final lines that's kind of important, sort of toward the end of the song.、Mm-hmm. And it's, I kind of sort of loathe myself. Now, this takes it beyond what you'd expect from just simple first word problems. It's like, okay, now we're back to existential reality. I kind of sort of loathe myself. Let me count the ways, and he drags that line out.、Mm. The ways, yet, I haven't got the blues yet. In which. He's really at rock bottom, he claims here. So you have to kind of wait through the song to listen to all these, like, the, these moments where he's not. All right, it seems like this is pure satire. Now you get to this moment, now all of a sudden you realize, no, he really is depressed, but he's not allowing himself to be depressed. Well, no, Let me he, count he, the ways I'm not. He said, like, kind of, sort of, loathes myself. I don't really hate myself. I, kinda, I guess if I really thought about it. Everybody it say all, that, though. Everybody says that. It all comes、yeah. down to it's, it's, it's worrying about the anticipation and eventuality of being depressed. He's sad because he is going to be sad. I think he's sad because he's not depressed yet and he can't be a real blues guy if he's not depressed. Yeah, it's <laughs> another, another meta but, song. I,、yeah. I mean. Well, then there's the end there that, but I'm experiencing malaise. <laughs> yeah, I, I love so, that word. I love that word. So he says it. Like, oh, I have ennui. <laughs> like, there is no musical genre called the Ennuis. <laughs> But there might be a band called the Ennuis. Yeah, and I wouldn't listen to them. <laughs> you, get a, this, you get a、principle. saxophone outro. The saxophone outro is mildly soulful and you, you get more than saxophone. There's an organ throughout.、Uh, the walking、oh, right. bass is have... phenomenal it's, it's, in this part. I love that. Yeah. No, it's, it's like. Like I said, it's got this very kind of nightclub jazz feel. Yeah, and it came back together. It was a nice. I love that. When it came down to it, this was a great way to, to close out the、yeah. album before well, we actually get to the end of the album. But it's yeah, a good it's way to like summate. Too bad this is、everything. another song. <laughs> yeah.、So、and we... the final track Last Day of the Year. This one to me just sounds like 
a last song on the album song. There's a yep, certain I wrote sound. That down too. It's like a uh, kind of a classic folky, almost or almost like like piece. I don't know. It's the kind of thing Tom Waits would do back in the day, like anywhere I lay my head, that kind of thing. Or just it like kind of big, almost sort a lullaby, of like kind of the swan song, the yeah. farewell serenade. It's I'm I don't know. And he's doing this whole New Year's thing, and I'm I don't know. At this point, I'm just kind of over it. What I what I did like about the song lyrically is that it's kind of half serious, kind of not, and it kind of dips in and out, and it kind of summates the record, which was sometimes serious, sometimes not. And so, while musically it didn't really do much for me, it just kind of sounded like a kind of easygoing lullaby. I liked in the music, even though the music was a little cliche. I liked how in the words it kind of wrapped up the feel of the record. I felt like it's, the last song could have summed up the album just as well, and you could have like left it at that. This is just like. I really gotta tie up the loose ends, and it's yeah. Did I, you really... It's is this Steve? I have to ask you this: Is this the equivalent it's of Man in Auditorium <laughs> with Piano for Folk? No, actually, the funny thing is that about this this last track, I I liked it just the, for one for one aspect uh, musically, and that was the fact that it seemed desperately to bring back a little bit of that whole klezmer thing just in terms of the way the mandolin stepped in there and did these little periodic swells in certain moments it seemed to kind of have this like this like anatevka way of slow of 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 leaving the album last day of the year well it is conclusive i agree that perhaps the la- the previous track was was more i guess on point from a thematic perspective mm-hmm. but from a musical perspective i kind of appreciate that the tone, just simply the musical tone in which, like, Anna Tefka would have on, on the play Fiddler on the Roof, if you're familiar. Yeah, of course, sure. Yeah. We actually are all very familiar. Oh, okay. yes. I don't know. This just well, like, super close, familiar, Closing but, the album with such an obvious closer feels almost condescending at this point. Well, like, we we could have handled a bit of ambiguity ending with the last song. I think it, it could have stopped there, and he's like, no, we got to make it neat, and it's just give us some credit to be able to find our own closure in that last bit or not have closure and be able to deal with that. We're adults. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a Damn little it. harsh for the final song here. It makes its claim its end of year thing. Well, I've it, had a it's, rough day. Fair enough. <laughs> and we'll get into all the depression in, in, in a little bit. Wait, we but haven't gotten into the depression just, uh, yet? We're not in the depression no, yet? No, we're not. No, I haven't just... listed my meds yet. Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> right, let's, let's... Whoa, we're going to get dark. First, I need to just address like, a few lyrics here to, to, to maybe just like, defend the song a little bit from, again, thematic purposes. You'll get in the swing of this New Year's thing. It's going to get the kind of persuasion. It's March. It's wet and cold. The new thing will feel old. Hangovers and headaches, they're last year's mistakes. Tomorrow, we'll go strain, quit smoking, and lose weight. Again, this stuff is kind of straightforward, but it's the stuff he has to tell himself when you consider the last several tracks, which have all been these, like, failed remedies. This is just yet another failed remedy, yeah. and it's the most obvious failed remedy of them all, and it's something that everyone is guilty of whenever that ball drops. I think it's just apt. I think it's apt. A- apt, <laughs> apt works. Apt. Why don't you yes. tell us how apt it really is, Steve? I, I just did. <laughs> no, no, I mean... You were on a roll. In the wrap-up? Yeah, you're on a roll, so... We don't like stopping well, you when you're on a roll. It's true. Oh, I'm not on a roll. That was a separate thought. I'll take it if you want. Yeah, you can take it. I'll I haven't got the blues yet. It's... I love the, the, the theme. I love the... Actual, the arc, musically does a lot too for me it 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 keeps it flowing it's it uses a lot of the story elements of the theme to keep the music and the changes in the music condensed and cohesive throughout the the actual album itself but the music just seems overly familiar i think is what it boils down to if it wasn't for the 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 mostly comical satire going on if it wasn't for well just the quality of his vocal work and some of the arrangements not all but some of the arrangements especially in the mandolin and banjo realm and the bass can't forget the bass Mm -hmm. there's not so much going on here that really feels fresh and that's something that uh, is something it's something that we were always looking for on this podcast we're always looking for new ways of doing the same things or new inventions that are deviants from previous ideas and there's just there's outside of the realm of the actual lyrical work there's very little deviation from previous forms 
this is the biggest problem I have with this album. Um, the fact that it's tight, it is really well done, and even the parts that are just kind of, oh, well, that's blues, or that's, you know, pop rock, or that's southern rock, it's still really good examples of these fields. But it's, a lot of times it just feels like examples of these fields. I laughed. I got a little creeped out. I enjoy the jokes and even the jokes that really that are just creepy that are are jokes but in such a way you're not supposed to laugh. It's a very good story. It's a great story. Um I think he did a an, an amazing job telling it. I just I want a, an infusion of something else to propel this story. Because while it is t- spoken from the point of view of a man who's now, frankly, old. He's born in the mid-40s. He's got some some age on him. That doesn't mean the music has to stay in his original tones. I would have liked something new there. Um, for that... It's a 375. I mean, the arc puts it up so high, but just the fact that everything is just too solidly familiar too solidly entrenched in, well, the decades you can call it from, it keeps it from really hitting four for me. If I was rating on theme alone, it'd be like a four or five or higher, but I can't. I really, really can't. The music the music is a big detractor. Well, I'm going to reel back, I think, from a little bit that I said earlier, uh, especially when I was, like, citing some of the moments in which I really enjoyed from a thematic perspective, you know, and how I, I noted the fact that it keeps going back and forth between the mundane and then the existential focus of death. Well, we've had a lot of stuff to kind of broach in this subject, but maybe not the mundane as much. That, I think, is actually kind of a unique thing. Most people, again, just in the same way I, I, I said there's no hero here, well, most people try to, most artists try to sort of promote themselves into, like, the main character of their epic tale, he, I appreciate him for being reserved, and I think taking that step back to say, no, there's, there's, there's no silver lining here. This is the life, <laughs> this is in the day in the life of a very sad, pathetic man, which, you know, I don't think it's like him, but it's the story itself, and I appreciate it for that. But I am going to pull a step back from where I was before in, in saying, like, okay, I, the way it goes back and forth between these two realities, I think that was less intentional and more of what I was ascribing. I think I prefer what I ascribe to this album uh, than what the album, in fact, is, which is more disparate. It, it's various different notions of being depressed, and of course we know from the, from the album title, I, haven't, I don't have, haven't had the blues yet. Um, it's, like, it's like he wants to address it, and he, he pursues it in various avenues, but I don't think the arc of, of this album is important. I don't think the direction that it takes I, I, is important. I think that it's just fan service sometimes. Like the first track, well, that's obvious fan service. And then the Klezmer route that he takes, well, that was just like one of the greatest musical... I'm not going to use the word accidents, but I think it was it was an experiment for this album that didn't really tie so closely in with theme, even the with the bare the barest of what I noticed in the final track, the Klezmer influence there, which would be the only other place. So that that leaves me with, again, most of what John said, disparate musical ideas that are still in his rooted folk style. The best thing about this is the lyrics and his vocal inflection. Um, unfortunately, that's just not enough. I wanted, frankly, more of a through line with that, that sort of Klezmer environment. I think that would have been a great, great focus for the remainder of this track. Granted, he would have had to trade out certain ideas, like, probably couldn't have gone with the Radio Christmas route. Or um, the Mork. But, you know, for, yeah, but to be honest, I could have done without that, that Christmas stuff. I think, I think they could have been replaced by better concepts in a similar vein. Just some more of a musical through line could have really, really aided this album. And because of the familiarity that, that John pointed out, I think, I think I have to go just a little bit lower. I think this is, this is a 3-5. I really, really respect all of the, um, uh, all of the... I respect what he's going through. I think I empathize with this character a lot, but it's just the music doesn't always support it. It's there, and sometimes it's not, and then sometimes it's back again. Sometimes it it leaves, and I barely even noticed it was around. Maybe that's the point of of the of the overall style, but 
I, I just I want a little bit more. I, I need more. I need more integration than that. So three five I think is a a fair rating, and it's it's better than average, which would be the solid three for theme alone. Which is good. Um, I honestly didn't know what to expect from this album. I mean, um, based on just what. Uh, Painless had brought us last time when he came on. It's it, he's nothing if, if full of surprises, but also what I really like about what you bring is you try to bring stuff, even if it's kind of accidentally. It's still somewhat tangentially related to what your influences are or things that you're interested in, mm-hmm. which I like when we have musicians on when they bring stuff that's from their influences or in their vein. Um, I. I mean, hands down, I liked the record. Um, I was actually surprised how much I liked the record in certain parts, just because, I mean, I'm, I don't really have an ear for blues. It's not that I don't like it. It's just that I haven't mm-hmm. literally listened to a lot of it. So the things here that I readily recognized as blues and really enjoyed was exciting. Um, I mean, there's not a lot more to say besides what you guys have already said. The theme is strong, lyrically, musically, not as much. Spaced is by far my favorite track, too. A, B, as a personal anthem. B, because it was probably one of the most fun and inventive tracks on the record. And it can be taken very separately, too, for that yeah. reason. Um, but I like a lot of the other tracks, too. I think as a whole, though, it does not hold up as far as... I agree. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we'd heard before. But I, I want to wait, focus on that that's not always a bad thing in the fact that what he does that we've heard before, he does very well. And I think that it's... The only disappointment is that he didn't add other things. And I think points that even uh, Painless has pointed out, like at the end, the track 14 was a cop-out, practically. You know, <laughs> and it's a bit of a bummer. Because he could have done, he could have ended it at 13 and left it more ambiguous. And it's, I think, choices like that that of really kind you, of hurt this album. your issues with this album, <laughs> that final track. Hey, it's, I, big I, issue. it's just interesting to me, I don't know. Big issue. Look, I don't want to get hung up on, on the final track. Truthfully, I did really like the record, and I also like when guests bring something that I would probably not have found on my own. I mean, my connection to folk and, and of course, to you, I, the, the polybanderous bands that that, <laughs> that Painless is in, because I'm, of course, sleeping with one of the members of the Wasties. <gasps> Shocker! Um, uh, I'm also marrying her. But the the point that... Thank God, you're going to make an honest woman out of her. <laughs> yeah, it's true. No, but the, the the point is is that because of that connection to folk also, it's nice to hear more stuff in the vein of something that I didn't really have a lot of experience with. Mm. Uh, but I can't ignore what Steve has been saying and what John's been saying. That th- Musically, I wanted a little more. And it's a lot for me to say that, because usually the emotionality and the connection is enough. But I only connected on a handful of songs, then there were a couple of laughs... And that was it. All in all, I think I'm kind of more even with John, though, because I am going to rate a little higher because I did emotionally connect to a, a, quite a few tracks that were truly beautiful. So I'm I'm at a three seven five also where John is. I think that it's cl- close to approaching a four. I get where your closer to median rating is, Steve, but for me, because of that emotional connection on, on several tracks, either through joy or through depression or through emotionality, just in a more vaguer sense. Hey, it, all it that stuff is great. In many ways, I, I I thought I was defending defending this album. I think more than you guys uh, over the course of it. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, I really really enjoy so many parts of this record. It's the integration in the end that's one of the ways I just I can't justify it. That's, yeah, it's a three five is still a good rating. No, I'm not. I I'm enjoy not my three five. Hires. I'm not downplaying your rating. I would don't say your pennies in a knot. I would say this would have been a great album to come out in the 60s or 70s. It would have fit right in. It would have been a great, like, opening album. Like, people would have been blown away if this was his first 1972 album. It it it, it also does a great job of introducing classic forms of music, pre-1970 music, to modern audiences. Which, for that, I can't fault it for. Tell you what, 3-6, cheers. All right, mm. excellent. Uh, Painless, take us into your wrap-up. All right, so part of my problem with reviewing this album might be that, um, again, I was introduced to quite a few of these songs and Mr. Wainwright himself seeing him live, which is a very different experience because, again, he was just doing this solo with a guitar on a stage, which means everything was a bit more stripped down. Well, in some cases, a lot more stripped down um, but also you get the raw intensity of a live performance, and the, and he's one of those people who can take his songs and really do them different than the record in, in ways that are intense and profound and beautiful. So just trying to divorce that experience of like 
you know, I, I when when I think about the album and about the song, I I still thinking about him and the experience of seeing him live. But that is obviously different from the album. And um, well, there there are definitely some songs that I really love here. And I do, for a folk guy who is you know has a long established career and mostly has a big fan base, who isn't expecting him to do anything too crazy. Um, relative to that metier. He does take a lot of chances, or, or a few chances, definitely. He does, you know, it's, for a folk album, it is fairly inventive, especially on some of the early things. But that's the thing, this album is top-heavy. It it peters out in terms of its ideas and inventiveness musically uh, towards the end. And as much as I love lyrics, and, he's, you know, this is, he's a lyrics guy. His, his greatest wizardry is wizardry is with his words um but you gotta back it up with a good tune and and it just starts falling a bit flat towards the end it gets it starts dragging um the top heaviness i think is an important yeah. thing that you mentioned which we uh, we didn't reference we didn't mention ourselves but it was self-apparent if you listen to the analysis yeah, this, it, it's cool that the album does have a flow it's got you know th- dealing with mortality and aging and death and and as an arc it works well. Um, I think altogether, I think I might just give this album a three. Mm-hmm. Look at that. I, I, I just, I think I, I know he can do so much better. That's I've fair. seen him do better That's with it. a lot of these This songs. is what I like about Painless. Everybody co- strolls in here thinking they're going to give us the best album in the world. That's not everything. Sometimes you just bring an album you want to discuss. I had something amazing lined up, and you guys were like, it's too old. So I... It's like, you know, this I had a connection to. But, yeah, it's not my favorite album ever of stuff I've heard recently. We'll find a way for you it's to integrate got, that it's album. Got, it's, it's got... This one has some really standout stuff on it. As a whole, taken as a whole as an album, I'm, I'm giving it a three. I think uh, I think Loudon can do better. All right. Well, there's some variety in, in ratings, which is always important. Well... The variety is in our guest, but um, from here we'll we'll take a break and we'll have a more tunes. painless, yeah, more tunes. Have him play another song for us, and we'll chat when we get back. I wish I had more money. I wish I had more time. I wish someone would pay me every time I made a rhyme. Wish I had a better job, at least a better bed. Wish my baby didn't have to work so hard to keep us fed. I wish there was a pill to take to get me off my ass. I wish I had more follow through, wish I'd stayed awake in class. But when all is said and done, my life it ain't so terrible. And if wishes were horses, whew. The smell would be unbearable I know, I know (sighs) I wish I was in better shape I wish I'd learned to dance Wish I could whisk my baby off For a week or two in France I wish I had insurance Wish grandma wasn't dead Wish something besides whiskey Stopped this chatter in my head Wish I could get off these meds And wander through the town Without this fucking city Grinding me into the ground But when all is said and done My life it ain't so terrible And if wishes were horses Man, the smell would be unbearable Yeah, when all is said and done My life, it ain't so terrible If wishes were horses Man, the smell would be unbearable So thanks for that, Painless. That was If Wishes Were Horses, which is is, is kind of a track that I was hinting at earlier because you kind of... It's it's a pretty straight, serious track, but there are 
there's a little bit of comedy in in the middle in in the in the, in the courses, which mm-hmm. I like, and I think that that's that's a thing that you've always kind of done in your live music, which I appreciate is. You sprinkle a little humor in some of the songs. Some of them are sincere and serious, but some of them have a little bit of a laugh, which is nice, too. It adds to that entertainment. Yeah, yeah, you can't be a folky without being funny. It's against the rules. They take away your union card. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, I mean, I guess I was sitting around. this, This is a song that was born out of the frustrations that probably all of us feel sitting around this table um with, with with life with you know all the things that you know i just wish this were different i wish you know certain things that you find yourself helpless to fix or have failed at fixing because you didn't stick to your resolutions didn't have the courage of your convictions um you know i just every now and then i find myself in, in a point where i'm really frustrated with where my life is versus where i'd like it to be which isn't necessarily living in a palace or anything but just some basic things yeah. hence your humor and the yeah. little asides and in the song with the aside. you know you know as if you just had to step out of the art for the minute and just kind of breathe and and sort of reflect taking everything into account uh, which is why, in many ways, today's discussion, surprise, depression, mm-hmm. yeah. is very much related to this album. And it pursues the same concept of kind of going yeah. back and forth between really depressing concepts and trying to infuse it with some sort of of groundedness. Yeah, and part, part of it is like when, when, I, when I found myself writing something that is kind of confessional, I guess, it was outside of my comfort zone because I usually don't do stuff that's like obviously personal like that I, I, it's very hard for me um it's a lot easier to write something dark and spooky like drinking with the devil which is just a character yeah. <laughs> or you know maybe rich man i ain't so poor has a, a bit more earnestness to it but it's still you know some guy who's like riding the rails and stuff i've never ridden the rails i've never been a hobo um <laughs> it was imagining a character or other songs like morning person which is just funny it's just you know, yeah. a joke. This is you know, morning person is my man with a dog, maybe. Why? Or, well, some, what, or the the parking spot thing. Just something silly that yeah, we all hate waking up. But well, maybe that's another uh, reason and, why again yeah. I enjoyed uh, the album you brought today because and why I I, I stick with mm-hmm. my three six is because after all it, it it does there are no characters there and it seems like in almost every brand of folk I hear there always is that character. There's always yeah. this time frame shifting and this is the only thing that mm-hmm. that we noticed in this album that shifted time frame was the music itself the lyrics stay yeah. very very cold and grounded mm-hmm. so so yeah, yeah, this was very much like this is me in my life and that's something that was a little scary for me to do because i i never f- i've written stuff like that before that i looked at and then hated it's very hard to be sort of personal and confessional and honest with yourself in a song and not feel that it looks trite or contrived or just like hokey or maudlin and i will i will i will die a slow painful horrible death before being (laughs) maudlin damn it (laughs) so part of the part of the you know how i dealt with that was to to make a little bit of fun of it you know hey you know honestly things aren't so bad and if we all got our wishes then (laughs) <laughs> Don't listen to the band Maudlin of the Well because well, nah, nah. if they put the oh. word in their al- in their in their band oh, name, oh, you're in for it. You're in deep. Yeah, it might be ironic. Unlikely, it nah. wasn't. But I've heard their discography. <laughs> Thank you. No, go on there. Somehow, and, uh, yeah, but I, I just you know, and like I do deal with adversity oftentimes by you know trying to laugh at it. Well, I have a question along those lines. Um, yeah. When you're writing your music, do you find yourself sort of going along the same trend as what we described earlier with the blues, for instance, how the blues tends to kind of put you in a position where you're supposed to be writing about said depression, said mm-hmm. subjects, and then as part of the therapy that that is why most people go into music and, and, and enjoy it so much and make it part of their lifestyle and careers... You, you find yourself kind of grappling with, like, well, I'm not depressed anymore. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. it's a matter of contrasting the the character, which wasn't an intended character to begin with, mm-hmm. but was just simply you, with now the you that you've become by the mm-hmm. end of your songwriting process. Well, I mean, the problem is that oftentimes the kind of the catharsis and the not feeling so blue anymore is very transitory. Yeah. It doesn't last. Here, here's the thing. I'll, I'll sort of lay this down. There's sort of two kinds of situations where you got the blues, let's say, or you're bummed out, depressed. 
sometimes bad things happen in your life that really bum you out. Sometimes you're in a really bad situation, you know, tragedies happen, whatever. Um, and you have emotions about that. You feel loss, you feel guilt, you feel sadness, you feel grief, all these things. And, you know, we experience them as a result of things that happen in our lives. And it's an emotional response. And you deal with them by working through whatever caused it and getting over and feeling better, usually because it's dealing with something that is making you unhappy. The thing about, you know, then there's, then there's the other side of it. There's people in this world, myself included, that end up, because of various factors, with a chemical imbalance in their brain. That means that depression for me is a medical condition, which means I will be feeling miserable and hopeless and really down for no damn good reason. Which, which is royally screwed is the other way screwed. to say it. Yeah, which you know, it's like it's not because my life is really bad. In fact, part of you know what I find myself dealing with guilt that I you know, um, like the song says, my life it ain't so terrible. And like I do actually have a pretty decent life, and I'm engaged to a wonderful woman. I have a job. I have enough money for food, um, and and having fun and going out and having beers at the way station every now and again like yeah we're we're struggling to you know to survive and make ends meet and all that but you know there are literally millions of people in this city alone who have it way worse than i do and just feel like well i don't really have anything to feel that miserable about they're starving kids in india and i get to feeling kind of guilty and i have to remind myself it's not that I'm looking at all my first world problems and being like, oh, my life is so bad. It's like literally there's like brain chemistry things that are going on with my serotonin and all that stuff that are you know, sort of plunging me into this. Well, I find especially when it comes to um, people I know who had similar problems, uh, a lot of it, uh, apart from simply the art itself because some mm -hmm. obviously people who are artistically inclined kind of have been given a little bit of of a of a reprieve if not a cure for the same thing mm -hmm. um but then of course if if it's if it's not art it could be any form of perhaps like twisting it around to turn something that was as i termed mm -hmm. royally screwed into into an advantage where if it's art well then all of a sudden you're on stage and i know so many people and we've had uh guests on the podcast here who've described the idea of like being on stage as all of a sudden whisking away all of that and i was just mm -hmm. wondering whether whether you whether you ascribe to that as well yeah getting on stage and performing is a is um well part of it is, a, is a, it's a rush you know i'm sure. i'm not the kind of person who usually gets stage fright i really like being on stage and performing with people i like hamming it up it mm -hmm. doesn't show and, at all in your performances <laughs> Shut up in your face. <laughs> Smart ass. Um, he's right. I, I love being in front of a crowd. I find it incredibly enjoyable. Somebody actually suggested to me that part of it is actually being a performer is kind of putting on a mask. And it definitely is every, everything I do, you know, everything any musician does when they perform has an element of theater. Mm -hmm. Very little of it, say, if you're like a really serious jazz guy. A lot more of it if you're doing rock or pop or stuff or you're... You know, seeing so definitely plenty of theater in what I do, um, well, and, also... and and you're, you're almost hiding behind a persona and, and fa playing a fantasy and getting to play rock star, which is incredible fun, well, and, and de definitely like and and there is a rush to it. There is an excitement and an adrenaline that is very distracting from this general sort of baseline blah mm. that you get when you're going through depression. Well, I'd argue that. Um... Only that the mask thing, of course, can be interpreted multiple ways. Like, for instance, okay, people could say it's a mask. That's almost like to imply that it's, well, it's not the real you. But after all, if that's a part of you and a big part of your life, then mm. after all, these, this, this whole concept of the mask is mm. a very, like, subtle and, 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 and transient and, and uh, sort of, it, it crosses both sides of the tracks. You can... Mm -hmm. When you're on stage, theoretically, that is a part of you. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a doorway into the part of your subconscious that you would not otherwise be able to access if it was off stage or in the real world. So lots of this stuff just 
kind of, I mean, I don't think Freud really went in this direction, but he did a little bit, for instance, the concept that, well, it's situational, it's circumstance, and almost every single thing that, whether it's chemical balance or not, it's the place and the position that you put yourself in, and that, well, mm -hmm. if you're in, for instance, the positive open environments where you get to kind of be that uplifting person where you're invigorated as opposed to, uh, as opposed to trounced, then, well, that, that is theoretically not the cure, but the life you want to be in. I don't know. These are just various I ideas that I've heard put forth by other artists and, and a little bit myself. It's, there's multiple ways around this kind of thing is what I'm just complaining. Actually, I would say that for those of us that do suffer from things like those imbalances, the mask is one of the most important, th important things you could really develop. Just the ability to step out to your shell because regardless of, of, of situations that you are placed within, when you are suffering from depression, when you're really in the depths of one of those moods, uh, don't matter your, your situation. You could be winning a lottery. You could be scoring the, the final touchdown in a Super Bowl. You could be making decisions as a president. doesn't really matter. Nobody gives a damn. Neither does your depression. Neither does that position that your body has put yourself in, that your mind has put yourself uh -huh. in. You have to be able to put on that mask. Recently, um, last year, we lost Robin Williams, yeah. man suffering from depression mm -hmm. for untold years. Yet, his mask, bringing comedy to the lives of so many people, as, in, as, as powerful as it was and mm -hmm. as important, even that failed him in the end. It's it's only something you can really end up living with. That's that's what it really boils and, down yeah, to. Yeah, and depression. that's something I I think I'd, I'd come around to actually. It's something, um, you know, if because obviously I can't be on a stage all the time every night performing. <laughs> I got to live life. I got to do stuff. I got to go to work. I got to spend time on my own on the subway. I wasn't to suggesting that you should. Like if that was the uh, no, no, obviously yeah. no. I'm just saying this, like you know, for the rest of the time, and a lot, like something else I've found as as a coping mechanism, and I and I think this does tie into like what we're saying about the blues and this idea of like, well, there's nothing you can do about your shitty situation, but you can acknowledge it and sort of somehow make your peace with it, or commiserate, or share, or just talk about it. And a lot of times, what I find helps is not trying to run away from it but sort of like almost embracing it as a friend is a really good technique some people do almost trying to like take the mood they're feeling and try to visualize it as something like a little ball and personify like, it personify it and you know toss it away winston churchill would talk about depression as the black dogs and i've i've done that sometimes imagine like this big black dog and i named him dimitri <laughs> and I'll just I'll be out walking and you know on a day when I'm feeling really glum and sort of in, in the grips of it and just imagine this dog beside me and that's and then it's like it's externalized it's out of my body it's out of it's not me it's, it's not me it's not my person I'm not messed up it's just this thing that's happening to me this medical condition and it's like externalized and I can sort of be like friends with my depression <laughs> you know <laughs> no, sort that of be sounds like, like the commercials right there <laughs> well you know, it, it's it's hokey, but sometimes it works. And yeah. sometimes you could be like, okay, you know, you, I'm living with you. you the cartoon, big that monkey on my show. Yeah. But, um, well, also, but you, you, and, so, and instead of trying to running or deny, you just be like, okay, you're st you're here. Let's let's be buddies. You want to grab this, a pizza? There's something this reminds me of, real quick, and that's also the the way in which um, a lot of as of late, there's been a lot of research whole into the whole what separates like the introvert and the extrovert, and there's this concept, of course, that. Um, you know, a lot of defense for the introvert, which has been, I suppose, demonized very, very frequently, I think, in American mm -hmm. culture, um, maybe culture in the broad. But, of course, there are definitely things that come out of that. And a lot of the defense, it's sort of like, well, embracing your depression or embracing your your lifestyle as an introvert in that it's it's really the only way that you can actually bring out sometimes the best parts of you, ironically enough. Like, for instance, the fact that when a lot of people retreat into themselves, it's the sort of the door opener to the more uh, expansive forms of thinking that lead to intellectual creativity, without which you, you wouldn't be able to access it, for instance, if you were always focused on, like, well, 
got to meet up with the next person, got to meet up with the next person. If that becomes the primary focus, then all of a sudden your brain can't reallocate the time or the energy with which to focus on what is probably more the fulfilling thing in the end. It was just, again, another thing I've, I've, I've uh, stumbled across that ends up defending the, the concept of, of embracing these problems and, and promoting the idea that it's okay to live with it. Well, also, I've found in, in some of my worst moments when dealing with it that well, even if you can't externalize it, still acknowledging it is the first step to getting through it. I mean, I find myself, something I often do when I'm upset or depressed is I'll listen to depressing m music and people will think, oh, well, that'll perpetuate it. But it doesn't. If it drives you to tears, if it drives you to for the depression, you get you push through it and get out on the other yeah, side. You get a catharsis. Mm -hmm. and or so I, sometimes, again, like the blues can be depressing, but it's because they're commiserating. It's like, yeah, I feel you. I know what you mean. You feel it too. Somebody else out there knows what I'm going through, and you get that empathy. You get a relatability to it that really helps you push through to the other side. And I think that's been, as someone who is an emotional person, it's been one of the strongest tools for me is music, and to listen to that music that makes me feel those feelings further and push me through to the other More side. More sadly, sometimes it's a way to make you feel something. Yeah. Like for people who are grappling with like the deadened states, well then, that, that's just, it, the catharsis isn't even, like you can't even put a, a, a finger on it. That's just, well, it's something. If it makes you, if it drives you to tears or even drives you to joy, well, then it served its purpose sometimes. It, then your, your door is open. Yeah, I, I think that, and I think it's also important to remind the listeners who are listening to us chat about this, that, that they're is never one right way. It's finding what works for you. And ultimately, if you don't know what works for you, talk to someone. If you have anybody to talk to, honestly, I'll put this out there. If you're, if you're a listener who's interacted with us before and you're having this moment and you have no one to talk to, send me an email. I'll respond. I've been through this. We've all been through this. Email painless. I'm sure you'd be happy to respond. It's, it's, yeah, hit me up on Facebook. I'll talk about it. It's it's one of those things that you ultimately you need to find a way that you can cope, and sometimes it's just a simple "Hey, I need help." It's that reaching out, mm. and, and 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 sometimes that's the strongest thing you can do is offer someone help. So I've been through it. I know pretty much everyone at this table has been through it at one point or another. Reach out if you think you have no one else. There's with the access we have with the internet and everything else. Reach out. Someone can help you. Yeah, and there's there's like a lot of. I mean, there's a little, you know, you sort of did talk about, like, the situation and where you're in and some of the, you know, one, one of the big triggers for me tends to be um, season changes. Like, um... Uh, part of winter. <laughs> yeah, it's the winter. Winter is... Um, the gray, it's just... Winter in New York and just, like, lack of sunlight and circadian rhythms messing up. Um, I'm a pro-winter guy, believe yeah, it or not. I, lo I love winter. I used to love it yeah. more than maybe I am lately, but that's only because it's like, I don't know, when, if ever you're in like a hermited state, then mm. it's like, then winter is really bad. Because then winter, and I remember, just to, to bring this back to music, I remember mm. St. Vincent referenced this perfectly in that, uh, uh, I believe it was the fifth track on the record, uh, Huey Newton, the, yeah. the entire internet, uh, excuse me, the winter of the internet, in which, of course, the way any modern person would interpret that as well, dive into the only thing you can really access and make you feel like you're a part of the world, which is, of course, the Internet. Mm -hmm. And if ever you're in a hermited state, well, the winter is going to really accentuate that because then you don't even have people inviting you to, say, the beach or the park or yeah. various summery things. And just, uh, yeah, when, when, once daylight savings time ends, um, sometimes I'll, I'll, like, struggle with things a lot more. Like, I'm, I can mostly manage most of the time. I'm functional. I'm okay. I got medications that do a pretty good job. Um, Keep, keeping me all right um but sometimes they, like this winter especially it's a combination of like just being at a desk job and getting very little physical activity and it being That'll especially <laughs> dark and gloomy um those are those are bad things like lack of sunlight lack of physical activity um so to that extent if you can like exercise indoors or ride a bike as much as you can or get a uh, you know proper bright light to use in the morning these are all things that can help a lot and um i've found like i don't know just a combination of things this winter just it's really been kicking my ass and i've been feeling really rough for the past few months and i'm, I'm really looking forward to spring that's what i was gonna say but, of course yeah, find those things don't be to afraid of yeah 
find those things to incorporate into your winter environment. Because mm. I, once upon a time, I really was like a proponent of winter. I loved it, I, especially uh-huh. like like w- fall, winter. As as part of New York City, there is this certain romance that goes with it. And I used to focus more on that because, mm. well, if if you're not in a hermited state, as I wasn't then, mm-hmm. when I was just like, then all of a sudden winter didn't ever have that connotation. I found myself always at odds with everyone mm-hmm. who was like, man, winter really gets me down. And I'm like, ah, it's New York City, the yeah. snowfall, it's great, it's the best time in the world. You know, mm, yeah, I think it there's... changes. I think, you know, that's another factor, living in New York. I think there's something about the psychogeography of the city that um, will really kind of grind you down if you let it. And, and yeah. I feel like it's it's harder for me to cope with winters here, so especially like, oh, God, I hate going into, like, lower Manhattan. Uh, when, in, in the, the winter, winter, well, especially when you're dealing with, like, slush. I will say not that just, if you're going to uh, deal you know, with winter. It's not the slush. Even when it's completely dry, it's just the the concrete canyons this, you know, especially like really down towards Wall Street, it gets something about the. It's got bad mojo. One, one of my, one of my. I don't know. I'm getting kind of sick of the city. Honestly, I'm I'm ready to live out in the country. Get a cabin. Enough. I always found that it was uh, a friend idea. of mine had a yeah. cabin like you know th- three mm-hmm. like an hour north of Lake George and it was like in the middle of mm-hmm. Adirondack Park. I love that And area. it was really, it's really great. Like yeah. you're just there's not another. Not like barely a smoke signal in the distance. You know, you walk out and it's mm-hmm. literally just pitch black. And there, it, oddly enough, in almost the same exact environment of the gray and the dark and the dead, strangely enough, you can find the, like more solace there than you can even like in the summertime. Because so, there's trees. Shows. Yes, trees. And a fireplace, I'm betting. Yes, a wooden you know, stove. Give, give me a wood stove cup of hot cocoa and a mandolin maybe some rum for the hot cocoa and one more to bring it back to music there's yes because it was built in the 70s there's an eight track player (laughs) oh that's and a bunch of just old eight tracks Uh, lying around that we would just pop in let's mm -hmm. see what this is (laughs) yeah and even i will say even not performing just like coming home sometimes just picking up a guitar or an instrument and playing for a bit um we'll, we'll get my mind off it when it gets bad and um Quick plug for uh, for pharmaceuticals. Meds won't work for everybody, but they might work for you. So don't be afraid of them. Give them a shot. And and just to kind of jump on to the thing you guys are talking about, the city. I found that it didn't bother me until I was made aware of it. Like I don't know. I grew up. I'm born in New York. I've lived here my whole life. So in Staten mm-hmm. Island, though, it's more suburban, so it's it's less intense. But being in Brooklyn, which is much closer to the city, more of a city environment, and working in Manhattan, it's like the song that we've mentioned, I've mentioned before on the show, and I know um, Painless has listened to it as well as you guys have, The City by Schaefer the Dark Lord, really talks about that. It talks about how the city feels like it's breathing on you almost. Mm-hmm. And, and, and those tall buildings, the gray sky can really do that. And I think that acknowledging these things, though, are important to getting through it. Yeah. And I... I don't know. Sometimes it feels like the the way the rents keep going up and everything just like feels more and more like if you don't have a lot of money, this city does not want you here. Yeah, and it, a it, lot of old timers will of course harken back to like, well, the seventies, man, that was the greatest time to be in the city. Of course, you could take that both ways because also the city was like a mess in the seventies and like horrible from the the, the crime perspective and and various other. Have a great time until you get shot. Yeah, exactly. But it's like, oh man, the, just the the environment and the cultural aptitude at the time was just so much uh so much more uh it, it it welcomed people in it welcomed people in from all across the country supposedly at the time was you just got a loft you could have a recording space theoretically anything was in your grasp then so again all of this does seem to be out of our reach these days um because in the post gentrification world yeah all you're left at is is Canyons and and expenses. Oh, well, you could go to Detroit, but then you're in Detroit. You then, <laughs> <laughs> then you're in Detroit. Maybe it's the seventies of seventies uh, New York City. If I don't know. On a whole, though, I think it's it, the, the obviously the, the 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 whole overall point of all of this is to try and you should try and use depression as an advantage, not a disability. Just do what you can to get through it. To mm-hmm. to use it to your advantage, whether it's artistically, uh, perspectively anything you know or medically you know and whatever you can don't do don't be embarrassed nope. by it be cuz you you'll you'll find that a lot more people than you think have dealt with it and may even you know be taking meds or seeing a shrink or whatever works for them um you know especially like i was saying i've sort of had these times when i felt kind of guilty that i was feeling miserable about nothing it's okay 
Yeah, you should. It's okay. Don't be embarrassed, and don't don't keep it to yourself, because because friends are one of the most important things that that can help you feel better. Sometimes one person is all it takes. And uh-huh. of course, I'll take this opportunity to once again thank you for bringing on today's album because, again, of 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 all its ups and downs, my favorite thing about it is its exploration of perspective when it comes to depression mm-hmm. and all the various ways it explains that. Well, sometimes there's just never that one thing until mm-hmm. you find it, and well, mm-hmm. sometimes that's left to chance. Sometimes you may mm-hmm. know it and are not even really re- realizing it and accessing it. So think about it. Think about it. Uh, let's take this moment to start wrapping up the show this week. Of course, thank you, Painless, for coming back. It's always a pleasure to have you, and you're always welcome to come back. I look forward to your next trip onto the show. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be here, and thank you for letting me talk about some kind of heavy stuff. Our pleasure. Um, it's uh, not everybody's cup of tea, but I feel better for talking about it, and it's, I, th- I think it's important for more people to be vocal about it. I agree. Um, before we, we let you give us our wrap up and I, uh, tell what you've got in store for the end of the show, um, Steve, why don't you take us to our fan mail of the week as we still continue to get a few comments here and there on the site and some emails from our fans. Oh, John. <laughs> yes. Uh, this fan mail is directed straight to you. Oh, indeed. Yes. And it was found on your Doodles page, which, by the way, is still in our main menu. It has not been updated recently, but you, you used to keep it quite rigorously. Called well, John's Doodles, and it's right there in the main menu. Uh, frankly, we've moved recording areas several times, and it's not conducive for me to be doodling during the show, as well as the fact that, frankly, we take this a lot more seriously than I used to, and I, I don't let my mind wander that much anymore. Well, nevertheless, our good friend Jose, who has commented uh, on us uh, before, sent us d- direct mail and also uh, a recommendation. He recommended us uh, Daryl's Ohio back in episode 114. And, well, he just thought he'd take a step further to comment on one of the less academic parts of the site, but yet nonetheless enjoyable, and that is your old doodles. So he's looking back through the John of then, and he says, Browsing through these doodles leaves me with the impression that John's imagination is much like that of a cat. Sometimes it's calm, calculating, and chill. Other times it's spastic, a tad weird, the cool kind, and unpredictable. These sketches didn't have to be put on the website, but having them there gives a great, more personal touch. So, uh, oh, and he also mentions doodle number six is my favorite. So, look at all that. See? That's all about your doodles. (laughs) I wish I still had the... That's the best kind of comment you ever could receive to the doodles, too. I, I, wish, I wish I could be more childish and, and ignore you guys as you talk so I could draw on, on, on a piece of paper again, but I, I can't do that. I, I apologize. Uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to, in which to revamp the doodles in one way, shape, or form. Um, they're still very much in the testing phases, but I promise something soon. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's, vague that's, as always. I'm well, very political about this vague one. Vague as always. Thank While you, on the topic of John, he's picking our next record for next week. So, John, what have you got for us? I have Cinematic Electronica. Nice. Or at least that's one way it's being described. The artist is Kangding Ray, and the album is Solon's Ark. So by Cinematic Electronica, is that what you said? Yes, that's, that's one way it's been described. Merely by having more of a, like, cinematic... Uh, Not a d- d- touch? Just movie-esque feel, but it's more uh, it's in, in, in an ambient way. Cinematic in an ambient it's way. It's broad, perhaps. It pursues more of like a uh, like a symphonic kind of form. Yes. In the electronica. Okay. All right. All right. I'm interested. Um, I also want to now, of course, uh, mention the song that we're going to close out with that Pamela's going to perform for us. It's actually a brand new track. Is that correct? Yep, this is the world premiere, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it here first at Crash Chords. And it's Bad Brain Blues, but before we get there, can you take us out, Painless Parker? Music is life, life is good. Sun's in the sky, but it don't shine, no, it don't shine for me. Sun's in the sky, but it don't shine for me. Hey mama, what do you say? Makes no difference anyway. Sun's in the sky, but it don't shine for me. The girls are pretty, but they got no eyes. They ain't got no eyes for me. The girls are pretty, but they got no eyes for me. 
Hey mama, what do you say? Makes no difference anyway. Girls are pretty, but they got no eyes for me. He's out buzzing, but the honey ain't sweet. No, the honey ain't sweet to me. I said the bees are buzzing, but the honey ain't sweet to me. Hey, hey, mama, what do you say? Makes no difference anyway. The bees are buzzing, but the honey ain't sweet to me. Bottle's empty, but I just can't, no, I just can't get tight. I said the bottle is empty, but I just can't get tight. Hey mama, what do you say? Makes no difference anyway. Bottle is dandy, but I just can't get tight. No sir. And it's hot, but I don't care. No, I don't care to dance. I know the band is hot, but I don't care to dance. Hey mama, what do you say? Makes no difference anyway. Band is hot, but I just don't care to dance. Turn my key, but this old car, no, this old car won't start. Lord knows I turn my key, but this old car won't start. Hey, hey, mama, what do you say? Makes no difference anyway. Turn my key, but this old car won't start. There's something bad inside this brain, inside this brain of mine. Oh, Lord, there's something bad inside this brain of mine. Mama, what do you say? Makes no difference anyway. Something bad inside this vein of mine. Ain't nothing for but to sing them blues, but to sing them bad brain blues. Oh Lord, ain't nothing for but to sing them bad brain blues. Yeah. Hey, Mama, what do you say? Makes no difference anyway. Nothing for but to sing them bad brain. If you enjoyed this and other album analyses, topics, and guests, please subscribe to the Crash Chords Podcast on iTunes, where you can also rate us and review us. For more media, also subscribe to Matt's one-on-one interview series, Crash Chords Autographs. To receive emails on all new content, subscribe at the top of our homepage. Also receive updates by liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter at Crash Chords Web, our Tumblr, and our YouTube channel. And remember, keep the discussion going, because music is life, and life is good. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to share them in the comment board below each post. Otherwise, email us directly at admin at crashchords.com.